to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized uh, to declare a recess of the committee at any time. As a reminder, I ask all members to keep themselves muted when they are not being recognized. This will minimize disturbances while members are asking questions of our witnesses. The staff have been instructed not to mute members except where members not being recognized and there is inadvertent background noise. Members are also reminded that they may only participate in one remote proceeding at a time. If you are participating today, please keep your cameras on. And if you choose to attend a different remote proceeding, please turn your camera off. Today, we will make an exception and allow members from Texas to participate without their video function. If they are experiencing power outages that prevent them uh, from having their videos working. If members wish to be recognized during the hearing, please identify yourself by name to facilitate recognition. I would also ask that members be patient as the chair proceeds, given the nature of conducting community, uh, committee of business virtually. So this hearing is entitled Game Stopped, who wins and loses when short sellers, social media, and retail investors collide. I now recognize myself for three minutes to give an opening statement. Good afternoon, everyone. This hearing will be the first in a series of hearings for the committee to examine the recent market volatility involving GameStop and other stocks. I want to know how each of the witnesses here today and the companies they represent contributed to the historic trading events in January. This recent market volatility has put a national spotlight on institutional practices by Wall Street firms and prompted discussion about the evolving role of technology and social media in our markets. These events have illuminated potential conflicts of interest and the predatory ways that certain funds operate, and they have demonstrated the enormous potential power of social media in our markets. They have also raised issues involving gamification of trading, potential harm to retail investors, and the business models of apps with retail investors as their users. All of this is why we have witnesses from many of the key players here to testify today, including witnesses representing Wall Street firms, Melvin Capital and Citadel, social media company, Reddit, trading app Robinhood, as well as one of the retail investors involved. In subsequent hearings, we will hear from regulators and other experts regarding these events, including why Dodd-Frank rulemakings related to short selling disclosures were never implemented. Many Americans feel that the system is stacked against them and no matter what, Wall Street always wins. In this instance, many retail investors appeared motivated by a desire to beat Wall Street at its own game. And given the losses that many retail investors have sustained as a result of volatility in the system, there are many whose belief uh, that the system is rigged against them has been reinforced. Others have noted that there are winners and there are losers in every trade in our financial markets. Our role as a financial services committee is to ensure fairness in our financial markets and system robust protections for investors and accountability for Wall Street. Today, we will hear firsthand from the witnesses regarding these events. The hearing will be an opportunity for this committee to get the facts about the role each of the entities of the witnesses represent played in the events we are examining today. Now, I recognize the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry, for five minutes. Well, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, let me just begin by saying, I believe Americans are far more sophisticated, informed, and capable than people in DC give them credit for. When I called for this hearing last month, I wanted this to be a fact-finding mission. We have speculation, we have headlines and finger pointing, but we don't have the facts. 
We need facts, not just the salacious bits or nasty comments on Reddit. And look, there's plenty of that. We need the facts today. Now, some on the left are already floating new restrictions or things to, quote, protect these so-called uninformed retail investors who, in their eyes, don't know the difference between the a Doge coin and the Dow Jones without Congress telling them. I think if, we're, if we've learned anything from the past few weeks, it's that these average everyday investors are pretty darn sophisticated. There is wisdom to the crowd. So let's zoom out on that idea just for a moment. The GameStop story represents a larger truth. A fundamental change is happening. Like never before, everyday investors can communicate, access more information, and work collectively to move markets all in real time. Technology is fueling this revolution. Congress cannot put technology back in the box. GameStop is the culmination of years of pinup frustration. That frustration is now paired with faster, cheaper, and better technology. Consider for a moment that for every story of someone being able to pay off their student debt uh, from the GameStop trade, or conversely, every story of somebody who lost money, there were stories of those who said they were investing in protest. In protest, they would gladly risk losing money just to prove a point. And now, uh, and while no one should ever risk investing money that they cannot afford to lose, let's tell the truth of why someone would do something like that. The sad truth is the K-shaped economy is nothing new in our capital markets because the structural core of our regulations literally enshrined in equity. Policies like the credit investor definition blatantly pick winners and losers. If you're wealthy, you're good to go. And if you're not, you're deemed too dumb to be trusted with your own money. So a privileged few get to invest alongside Ivy League endowments, getting early access in private markets to the greatest returns of the last two generations. But not so fast for the every, average everyday investor. In the eyes of our government, you need to be protected, protected from your own decisions, protected from your own money, protected from more opportunities. So you are left with a savings account, which pays no interest. And if you need more money than that, well, we created a world where it's easier to go buy a lottery ticket than it is to invest in the next Google. Is it any wonder why the unhealthy dynamics of GameStop happened? It's time we get serious about equity and ownership in the American economy. We should live in a world where the construction worker or Uber driver trading on Robinhood has the same access to equity shares in Robinhood itself as the white collar employees who work there. Same goes for Reddit and Reddit users, by the way. Both contributed to, to its success. Why can't both share in its future success? So I'll conclude with a reminder for some of my colleagues who want to regulate more and more. In the 1980s, Massachusetts state regulators barred citizens from investing in what the Wall Street Journal called the latest in a cascade of stocks of high technology companies that occurred that year. What IPO was too risky in the eyes of the government? Apple. So instead of shutting the American public out through new regulations, new forms of taxation or so-called protections, let's use this opportunity instead to side with them. So I'll begin where I started. Americans are far more sophisticated, informed, and capable than folks in DC give them credit for. And it's time our securities laws treat them that way. I look forward to the hearing and I yield back. Thank you so very much. Uh, I'm so pleased uh, that you are cooperating today and you were eager to join with us. Uh, when we uh, call for this committee. So I want to welcome today <laughs> the distinguished witnesses to the committee. Mr. Vlad Tenef is the Chief Executive Officer of Robinhood Markets Incorporated, a company with a trading app that after increased trading activity in GameStop and certain other stocks, restricted trading of those stocks for a period of time. Mr. Kenneth C. Griffin is the Chief Executive Officer of Citadel, LLC, a fund 
which is one of Robin Hood's main customers and sources of revenue, which also provided financial support to Melvin Capital Management LP when Melvin faced significant losses over GameStop and other trades. Gabriel Parker is the Chief Executive Officer of Melvin Capital Management LP, which held a significant short position in GameStop and other stocks and experienced significant losses due to its positions. Steve Huffman is the Chief Executive Officer, co-founder of Reddit, a social media platform which is home to the subreddit Wall Street Bets, where retail investors discuss trading and where a large number of members discuss the purchase of GameStop and other stocks which experience volatility. Mr. Keith Gill is a retail investor who posted on Reddit and YouTube regarding investing in GameStop and other stocks. Jennifer Gulp is a director of financial regulation studies at the Cato Institute. Without objection, your written statements will be made part of the record. Each of you will have five minutes to summarize testimony. Chairman here. It was my, I believe that there are only three minutes of Democratic opening statements uh, with the idea that uh, the subcommittee chair on the Democratic side would be called as well. Uh, that's what I was told by your staff. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, if uh, that is the order uh, that has been organized, I will cease my introductions and I will call on you, Mr. Sherman, uh, to please go ahead and uh, make an opening statement. Thank you. Thank you thank so you. much. Back in the day, the law school professor would create an exam where he'd weave together a story that would exemplify each of the issues in that area of the law. But never did the professor do it as good a job as the GameStop saga, which identifies most of the issues facing our capital markets. Short selling. Could there be limits or required additional disclosures? What do we do with market participants, whether they be on Reddit or in, on Wall Street, who are shorting a stock or buying a stock for the purpose of influencing its price. What is this payment for order flow model? And what does it mean when some participants get best execution and some get enhanced best execution? The price enhanced best execution and are all traders being treated fairly and is payment for order flow free to the consumer? We need to look at the plumbing where it takes two days to settle a transaction, but also why is it the broker's capital rather than the customer's capital that is posted uh, during the two day period. And finally, we need to look at the gamification and glorification of high frequency uh, trading. I thank uh, the chairwoman for uh, the time and I hope uh, that uh, in the months to come, we have several hearings to explore these issues and that we're able to pass legislation this year to deal with each of them, and I yield back. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the chairman of the subcommittee of oversight and investigations, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for one minute. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to express some concerns that I have. It is a fact that Citadel Securities has paid over $100 million in penalties. And my concern is this. It deals with whether we can allow a market maker's profits from misleading clients and improperly trading ahead of clients to become something as simple as the cost of doing business. The risk of punishments for violations must always exceed the rewards to deter the risk. I'm concerned and my hope is that we'll get some additional intelligence on how these punishments have impacted the rewards that have been received. I yield back. Thank you very much. And I will go back to the introduction of our witnesses. I left off with Jennifer Scott, uh, Director of Financial Regulation Studies at the Cato Institute. Without objection, your written statements will be made part of the record. 
Each of you will have five minutes to summarize your testimony. You should be able to see a timer on your screen that will indicate how much time you have left. And a time will go off at the end of your time. I would ask you to be mindful of the timer and quickly wrap up your testimony if you hear the chime. Now, before we begin uh, with your oral testimonies, I would like to swear in the witnesses. I will call each of your names individually to respond. Would you please raise your hands? Do you solemnly swear to affirm that the testimony you will give for this committee in the matters now under consideration will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Mr. Tanel? I do. Mr. Griffin? I do. Mr. Plotkin? Mr. Plotkin? I was muted, I apologize, I do. Thank you. Mr. Huffman? I do. Mr. Gill? I do. Ms. Gluck? I do. Thank you very much. Let the record show that all of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. We will now begin with their oral testimonies. Mr. Tanev, you are recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, members of the committee. My name is Vlad Tenev, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer and co-founder of Robinhood. Thank you for the invitation to speak about Robinhood and the millions of people we serve. Almost eight years ago, Beju Bhatt and I founded Robinhood. We believed then, as we do now, that the financial system should be built to work for everyone, not just a select few. We dreamed of making investing more accessible, especially for people without a lot of money. The stock market is a powerful wealth creator, but half of U.S. Mr. households Mr. participate in it. Uh, I would like you to use your limited time to talk directly to what happened January 28th and your involvement in it. Certainly. Madam Chair, Madam Chair, the witness has the opportunity to, to to give their own testimony. Excuse me, you are, not time for your questioning. you are not recognized, uh, Mr. Uh, please go right in and, and speak directly to the question. McHenry. Mr. McHenry, yes, of course. <laughs> we created Robinhood to economically empower all Americans by opening financial markets to them. I was born in Bulgaria, a country with a financial system that was on the verge of collapse. At the age of five, I immigrated with my family to America in search of a better life. I have benefited from all America has to offer. And Robinhood's mission to democratize finance for all has a very special significance for me. Robinhood's platform allows people from all backgrounds to invest with no account minimums and zero commissions. Contrary to some very misleading and highly uninformed reports, we see evidence that most of our customers are investing for the long term with features like fractional shares, dividend reinvestment, recurring investments. Our customers can start with small amounts and grow their investments in blue chip stocks and ETFs over time. We've always recognized the responsibility that comes with helping people invest. We'll continue to enhance our educational platform to help customers no matter where they are in their financial journey. Hundreds of free educational resources are available to everyone on our Learn website right now. While markets fluctuate, this tells me our business model is working for everyday Americans. The total value of our customers' assets on Robinhood exceeds the net amount of money they have deposited with us by over $35 billion. This, this tells me our business model is working for everyday Americans, the Robinhood community, Many people say that Robinhood has helped them to pay car loans, reduce student loan debt, meet daily bills, save for the future, and we're proud to serve them. You've invited me today to discuss the events of last month, and I welcome this opportunity. In late January, many brokerage firms saw a massive increase in trading activity in a handful of stocks. Prices were moving dramatically day to day, even hour to hour. One specific day, January 28th, 
proved to be a completely unprecedented event. The spike in trading activity and volatility meant that Robinhood Securities, our clearing broker, had to hold the line and post additional firm capital as collateral to support our clearing house deposit demands. To put it in perspective, on January 28th, our daily deposit requirement was 10 times more than on January 25th. As a result, Robinhood Securities, along with many other firms, imposed temporary trading restrictions on certain securities. We began allowing limited buys of these securities the following day, and we have since lifted the restrictions entirely. There are two points I want to make clear about these temporary restrictions. First, Robinhood Securities put the restrictions in place in an effort to meet increased regulatory deposit requirements, not to help hedge funds. We don't answer to hedge funds. We serve the millions of small investors who use our platform every day to invest. Second, Robinhood immediately secured additional funds. Altogether, through capital raising and other measures, we've increased our liquidity by more than $3 billion to cushion ourselves against increased collateral requirements and related market stress in the future. Despite the unprecedented market conditions in January, at the end of the day, what happened is unacceptable to us. To our customers, I'm sorry and I apologize. Please know that we are doing everything we can to make sure this won't happen again. And I wanna highlight one more thing. The existing two-day period to settle trades exposes investors and the industry to unnecessary risk. There is no reason why the greatest financial system in the world cannot settle trades in real time. I believe we can and should act now to deploy our intellectual capital and our engineering resources to move to real-time settlement. Together, we can solve this. Before I close, I want to sincerely thank the millions of customers who continue to use Robinhood to access the markets every day. We are grateful and committed to you. Members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to answer your questions. Mr. Griffith, you are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Chairman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the recent market events. The U.S. capital markets are the envy of the world. Our nation's ability to allocate capital to its best and highest use creates jobs, drives innovation, and fuels our economy. America's retail investors play an important role in our capital markets. According to Gallup, about 55% of Americans own stock right now. Citadel Securities, as the largest market maker in the U.S. equities market, executes more trades on behalf of retail investors than any other firm. As I will discuss shortly, Citadel Securities played an important role in meeting the needs of retail investors during the week of January 24th. Before doing so, I want to be perfectly clear. We had no role in Robin Hood's decision to limit trading in GameStop or any of the other meme stocks. I first learned of Robin Hood's trading restrictions only after they were publicly announced. All of us at Sales Securities are committed to the healthy functioning of the U.S. equities markets. Now, I first participated in the financial markets as a retail investor. In the late 1980s, while attending college, I traded stocks and options from my dorm room. My passion for investing led to my founding of Citadel in 1990. Today, Citadel is one of the world's leading alternative investment managers. Our capital partners include pension plans, colleges, hospitals, foundations, and research institutions. In 2002, my partners and I founded Citadel Securities. Today, Citadel Securities is one of the world's preeminent market makers. We have been a leader in using technology to transform our markets, particularly for retail investors. Citadel Securities invests hundreds of millions of dollars each year to serve the needs of our customers. In the last week of January, the importance of this investment was on full display. During the period of frenzied retail equities trading, Citadel Securities was able to provide continuous liquidity every minute of every trading day. When others were unable or unwilling to handle the heavy volumes, Citadel Securities was there. On Wednesday, January 27th, 
we executed 7.4 billion shares on behalf of retail investors. To put this into perspective, on that day, Citadel Securities executed more shares for retail investors than the entire average daily volume of the entire U.S. equities market in 2019. The magnitude of the orders routed to Citadel Securities reflects the confidence of the retail brokerage community in our firm's ability to deliver in all market conditions and underscores the critical importance of our resilient and stable systems. I could not be more proud of our team at Citadel Securities. My colleagues who were committed to ensuring that the interest of America's retail investors were served during this extraordinary period. Once again, I appreciate the opportunity to appear today and I look forward to answering your questions. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Griffin. Mr. Plotkin, you are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, and members of the committee, I would like to thank you for this opportunity to share Melvin Capital's perspective on the recent trading activity in GameStop. I am the founder and chief investment officer of Melvin Capital. I'm humbled by these unprecedented events. My investors on all sides, many investors on all sides have experienced losses. I am here today to share my own personal experience and to be helpful in this conversation. I understand that part of the focus of this hearing is the decision of stock trading platforms to limit trading in GameStop. I wanna make clear at the outset that Melvin Capital played absolutely no role in those trading platform decisions. In fact, Melvin closed out all of its positions in GameStop days before the platforms put those limitations in place. Like you, we learned about those limits from news reports. I also wanna make clear at the outset that contrary to many reports, Melvin Capital was not bailed out in the midst of these events. Citadel proactively reached out to become a new investor, similar to the investments others make in our funds. It was an opportunity for Citadel to buy low and earn returns for its investors if and when our funds value went up. To be sure, Melvin was managing through a difficult time, but we always had margin excess and we were not seeking a cash infusion. I'm here testifying today far removed from my background. I grew up in a middle-class family in Portland, Maine. I went to a public high school. I studied hard and got into a good college. Upon graduation, I did not have a job. Today, I'm married with four children and my time is spent with my family and on Melvin Capital, which I founded six years ago. I named Melvin after my grandfather who ran a convenience store. I wanted the firm to represent his values, integrity, hard work, taking care of customers and employees and commitment to excellence. Melvin Capital manages a hedge fund. Investors such as academic institutions, medical research and other charitable foundations, pension funds, retirees, and others invest with us. We have 36 employees and hundreds of investors, and I feel a personal duty to all of them. Melvin specializes in the consumer and technology sector, including companies like GameStop, AutoZone, and Expedia. Most of our investments are long. In other words, we buy stock in companies that create jobs, grow the economy and develop new products for consumers. We do this after extensive fundamental research, sometimes literally for years. When our research convinces us that a company will grow relative to expectations, we make a long-term investment. When our research suggests a company will not live up to expectations and its stock price is overvalued, we might short a stock. Like with our long positions, our practice is to short a stock for the long-term after extensive research. We also short stocks because when the markets go down, we have a duty to protect our investors' capital. There are laws governing shorting stock, and of course, we always follow them. In addition, it's very important to understand that absolutely none of Melvin's short positions are part of any effort to artificially depress or manipulate down with the price of a stock. Nothing about our short possession prevents a company from achieving its objectives. It is just Melvin's view about whether it will. Specific to GameStop, we had a research-supported view well before the recent events. In fact, we had been short GameStop since Melvin's inception six years earlier because we believed and still believe that its business model, selling new and used video games in physical stores, is being overtaken by digital downloads through the internet. And that trend only accelerated in 2020 when, because of the pandemic, people were downloading video games at home. As a result, the gaming industry had its best year ever but GameStop had significant losses. In January, 2021, a group on Reddit began to make posts 
about Melvin's specific investments. They took information contained in our SEC filings and encouraged others to trade in the opposite direction. Many of these posts were laced with anti-Semitic slurs directed at me and others. The post said things like, it's very clear we need a second Holocaust. The Jews can't keep getting away with this. Others sent similarly profane and racist text messages to me. In the frenzy during January, GameStop stock rose from $17 to a peak of $483. I do not think anyone would claim that the price had any relationship to the intrinsic value of the business. The unfortunate part of this episode is that ordinary investors who were convinced by a misleading frenzy to buy GameStop at $100, $200, or even $483 have now lost significant amounts. When this frenzy began, Melvin started closing out its position in GameStop at a loss. Not because our investment thesis had changed, but because something unprecedented was happening. We also reduced many other Melvin positions at significant losses, both long and short, that were the subject of similar posts. I'm personally humbled by what happened in January. Investors in Melvin suffered significant losses. It is now our job to earn it back. And while I do not think that anyone could have anticipated these events, I've learned much from them and I'm taking steps to protect our investors from anything like this happening in the future. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Plotkin. Mr. Huffman, you are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Thank you. Madam Chairwoman, Mr. Ranking Member, Honorable Members of the Committee, my name is Steve Huffman. I am the co-founder and CEO of Reddit, and I'm pleased to talk with you today about how Reddit works and what we have seen on our site in the past few weeks. Reddit's mission is to bring community and belonging to everyone in the world. What started in 2005 as a single community has since evolved into a vast network of many thousands of communities. They range from standard topics like news, sports, politics, to internet culture, to support. For example, our unemployment community has become a source of support for hundreds of thousands of Americans who have turned to Reddit after losing their jobs during the pandemic. Our communities are created and run by our users. Because of this, we describe Reddit as the most human place on the internet. Though we are small compared to the largest platforms, our communities provide an online home for millions of people every day. I'd like to share a bit about how content moderation on Reddit works. Reddit's moderation system starts with our content policy the platform-wide rules which all communities must follow. Among other things, these rules prohibit hate, harassment, bullying, and illegal activity on Reddit, and they are enforced by Reddit's anti-evil team, which is composed of engineers, data scientists, and other specialists. This team also ensures the integrity of the site, and we have continuously honed our methods to stay ahead of bad actors to protect Reddit from manipulation, spam, and other threats. This team searched high and low for the specific comment mentioned in the previous testimony or anything like it. The closest we could find was a single comment that received no votes and was deleted within five minutes. Such speech is not tolerated on Reddit, and we will of course investigate any further claims of this nature. Centralized moderation is common, but Reddit additionally uses a governance structure akin to a federal democracy, where the aforementioned policies and teams represent the federal government and the communities themselves represent states. All communities, or subreddits, are created by users that we call moderators. They set the community's rules, which may be as strict as they like, as long as they are not in conflict with the platform-wide policies, and they have a variety of tools of enforcing these rules independently. Moderators are not paid employees, but rather users who are passionate about their communities. They have the context and judgment to make decisions no algorithm could. The members of each community contribute both the content itself and the ranking of it by voting up or down on any post or comment. Unlike other platforms where submission has a built-in audience through the author's follower count, every piece of content on Reddit, no matter how famous the author, starts at zero and has to earn its visibility. Through their votes, the community itself enforces not just the explicit rules of their community, but also the unwritten rules that define their culture. This layered approach has helped our users create the most authentic communities online. The specific community we'd like to talk about today is Wall Street Bets. It's important to understand that Wall Street Bets is one of many finance and investing related communities on Reddit. This particular community specializes in higher risk, higher reward investments than what you might find in other more conservative financial communities on Reddit, with such names as personal finance, investing, and financial independence. I will stress that Wall Street Bets is first and foremost a real community. The self deprecating jokes, the memes, the crass at times language all reflect this. 
if you spend any time on Wall Street Bets, you'll find a significant de depth to this community exhibited by the affection its members show one another. They are just as quick to support a, a fellow member after a big loss as they are to celebrate after a big gain. A few weeks ago, we saw the power of community in general and of this community in particular when the traders of Wall Street Bets banded together at first to seize an investment opportunity not usually accessible to retail investors, but later more broadly to defend all retail in investors against the criticism of the financial establishment. With the increase in attention, Wall Street Bets unsurprisingly faced a surge in traffic and new users. At Reddit, our first duty in these situations is to our communities, and our role in this moment was to keep Wall Street Bets online. Working around the clock, we scaled our infrastructure, made technology changes to help this community withstand the onslaught of traffic, and we acted as diplomats to help resolve conflict within Wall Street Bets leadership. We have since analyzed the activity in Wall Street, in, in Wall Street Bets to determine whether bots, foreign agents, or other bad actors played a significant role. They have not. In every metric we checked, the activity in Wall Street Bets was well within normal parameters, and its moderation tools were working as expected. We will, of course, cooperate with valid legal requests from federal and state regulators. That said, we do believe that this community was well within the bounds of our own policies. To conclude, I would like to reiterate why it is important to protect online communities like Wall Street Bets. Wall Street Bets may look sophomoric or chaotic from the outside, but the fact that we're here today means they've managed to raise important issues about fairness and opportunity in our financial system. I'm proud they use Reddit to do so. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Huffman. Mr. Gill, you are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Thank you, Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, members of the committee. I'm happy to discuss with the committee my purchases of GameStop shares and my discussions of their fair value on social media. It is true that my investment in that company multiplied in value many times. For that, I feel enormously fortunate. I also believe the current price of the shares demonstrates that I've been right about the company. A few things I am not. I'm not a cat. I am not an institutional investor, nor am I a hedge fund. I do not have clients, and I do not provide personalized investment advice for fees or commissions. I'm just an individual whose investment in GameStop and posts on social media were based upon my own research and analysis. I grew up in Brockton, Massachusetts. My family was not wealthy. My father was a truck driver and my mom a registered nurse. I was one of three kids and the first in my family to earn a four year college degree when I graduated from Stonehill College in 2009. That was not a good time to be looking for a job. From 2010 to 2017, I worked at a few startup companies but there were significant periods when I was unemployed. I took an interest in the stock market and even though I had very little money, I used those times to educate myself and learn more about investing. In April 2019, after nearly two years unemployed, I accepted a marketing and financial education job at Mass Mutual. My wife Caroline and I were thrilled that I had an income and benefits. My job was to help develop financial education classes that advisors could present to prospective clients. I was not a stockbroker or a financial advisor. I did not talk to clients and I did not recommend stocks for them to buy. Before and after I joined Mass Mutual, I studied and followed stocks. One of those was GameStop. In early June of 2019, the price of GameStop stock declined below what I thought was its fair value. I invested in GameStop in 2019 and 2020 because as I studied the company, I became more and more confident in my analysis. Two important factors based entirely on publicly available information gave me confidence that GameStop was undervalued. First, the market was underestimating the prospects of GameStop's legacy business and overestimating the likelihood of bankruptcy. I grew up playing video games and shopping at GameStop, and I plan to continue shopping there. GameStop stores still provide real value to consumers and reliable revenue for GameStop. Second, I believe that GameStop has the potential to reinvent itself as the ultimate destination for gamers within the rapidly growing $200 billion gaming industry. GameStop has a unique opportunity to pivot toward a technology-driven business. 
by embracing the digital economy, GameStop may be able to find new revenue streams that vastly exceed the value of its business. I am hardly the only person who has advocated these points. When I wrote and spoke about GameStop and social media with other individual investors, our conversations were no different from people in a bar or in a golf course or at home talking or arguing about a stock. Hedge funds and other Wall Street firms have teams of analysts working together to compile research and analyze shares of companies. Individual investors do not have those resources. Social media platforms like Reddit, YouTube, and Twitter are leveling the playing field. The idea that I use social media to promote GameStop stock to unwitting investors and influence the market is preposterous. My post did not cause the movement of billions of dollars into GameStop shares. It is tragic that some people lost money and my heart goes out to them. But what happened in January just demonstrates again that investing in public securities is extremely risky. As I said earlier, I consider myself and my family fortunate with our investment. When the stock price broke $20 in December, I knew my investment was a success. I was so happy to visit my family in Brockton for the holidays. The money will go such a long way for us. We had an incredibly difficult 2020. Most difficult was the tragic and unexpected loss of my sister, Sarah, in June. I am grateful to be in a position to give back to and support my family. As for what happened in January, others will have to explain it. It's alarming how little we know about the inner workings of the market. And I am thankful that this committee is examining what happened. I also want to say that I support retail investors right to invest in what they want when they want. I support the right of individuals to send a message based on how they invest. As for me, I like the stock. I'm as bullish as I've ever been on a potential turnaround for GameStop, and I remain invested in the company. Thank you. Cheers, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Gill. Ms. Schlapp, you are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, and distinguished members of the Committee on Financial Services. My name is Jennifer Schulp, and I am the Director of Financial Regulation Studies at the Cato Institute Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives. Thank you for the opportunity to take part in today's hearing. Before addressing the GameStop phenomenon specifically, I'd like to talk about the participation of retail or individual investors in our public equities markets. Retail participation has ebbed and flowed over the years, but the recent upward trend accelerated sharply during the pandemic. Most point to zero commission trading, but several other factors also likely attracted retail investors, including fractional share trading, low account minimums, and easy app-based platforms. More time at home during the pandemic probably even played a role. Retail participation in our equities markets is important. The fact that retail investors behave differently from institutional ones and differently from each other can be particularly valuable in times of market stress. In fact, individual investors may have helped stabilize the market in March 2020. Importantly, investing in the stock market also provides a path to wealth for individual investors. But stock ownership traditionally has been skewed towards the already wealthy, and it is highly correlated with race, education, and age. Retail investors making up this new surge are different. Recent research by the FINRA Investor Education Foundation and NORC at the University of Chicago found that investors who opened accounts for the first time in 2020 were younger, had lower incomes, and were more racially diverse. These new investors also held lower account balances. This may portend, as one of the researchers noted, quote, a shift towards more equitable investment participation. These new opportunities for individuals to grow their wealth should be welcomed and expanded, not restricted. Now I'll turn to GameStop. At the outset, I will note that it is difficult to analyze the impact of the trading in GameStop and other stocks because many facts are unknown. But some things seem clear. Importantly, the temporary volatility in these stocks did not present a systemic risk to market function. As the Treasury Department recognized, 
the market's, quote, core infrastructure was resilient during high volatility and heavy trading volume. This is not surprising. Despite the huge trading volume and rapid increase in value, only a small part of the market was affected, and spillover effects on the wider market were mild and short-lived. The fact that GameStop traded temporarily, and perhaps still trades above fair estimates of the company's value, is not, by itself, a reason for concern. Stock prices move in and out of alignment all the time, and markets are no strangers to bubbles. If a company is valued by the market differently than a review of its fundamentals suggests, it might indicate that the analysis is missing relevant information about a company's prospects, or it might indicate that the company's stock price is due for a correction. The market's mechanisms, including the tool of short selling, generally work well to handle these circumstances. Stepping in to prevent trading where a stock price moves contrary to conventional wisdom could deprive the market of important informa information. The SEC, among a host of others, is reviewing the relevant trading and conducting a study of the events. The SEC will have access to far more information than has been made publicly available, and I believe it has the tools necessary to address any harmful misconduct that may have occurred. I cannot opine on whether any regulatory changes are warranted on this incomplete record. I tend to believe the answer will be no in light of the minimal impact on the market's function. But as regulators learn more, there may be areas identified for improvement. By no means, though, should these events lead to restrictions on retail investors' access to the markets. Thank you, and I welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Shaw. I now recognize myself five minutes for questions. The market volatility surrounding GameStop and other securities has highlighted how many people feel that the cards are stacked against them and that market participants, like our witnesses, hide the ball. Mr. Teneev, you explained that Robinhood restricted transactions in certain securities to meet demands coming from your clearinghouse. And yet, on January 28th, you represented uh, to the media that there was no uh, liquidity problem. Isn't it true that being concerned about having enough capital uh, to meet deposit requirements, isn't that a liquidity problem? Or could you just answer yes or no? Chairwoman Waters, I appreciate the opportunity to address that. Just yes or no? We always felt comfortable with our liquidity and the additional capital that Robinhood raised. Please answer yes or no. We always felt I comfortable my with our five minutes. I don't have time. I just need a yes or no answer. I, I stand by my statement. The additional capital we raised wasn't to meet capital requirements or deposit so requirements. The gentleman, Excuse see, me. I'm reclaiming my time. This liquidity problem had real consequences for your customers, but I wonder if they were all that surprised between December 2019 and December 2020. Robinhood customers experienced monetary losses due to system outages. Customer accounts were reportedly compromised. The firm repeatedly failed to testify its best execution obligations, and it misled its customers regarding its revenue sources. It seems retail investors often get a bad deal at Robinhood. Mr. Tanee, also, while you testified today that, quote, Robinhood's customers benefit greatly from payment for order flow, quote, unquote. In December 2020, the SEC charged Robinhood for not disclosing that it was getting uh, paid to send customer trades to Citadel Securities and other market makers and for not seeking the best terms for its customers' orders. Robinhood provided such inferior trade prices it cost your customers over $34 million. Is your testimony after Robinhood paid uh, is it your testimony after Robin had paid the SEC $65 million to settle those charges that this conflict of interest is in your customer's best interest? Yes or no? Chairwoman Waters, first, let me say regulatory compliance is at the center of everything that we do. We've made mistakes in the past. I'm not claiming that. Yes or no to that question. So Citadel Securities is an important counterparty. Nobody's denying that. The reason that 
Gentlemen, can I answer yes or no? I'm reclaiming my time. Meanwhile, Mr. Griffin, Citadel's role in this event also raises significant questions for policymakers. Citadel Securities pays Robinhood tens of millions of dollars to process trades by Robinhood's customers. This relationship gives Citadel Enterprise key non-public information as to direction and volume of trades by retail investors. Your firm makes use of private exchanges called dark pools and other um, off exchange trading to trade large sizes without moving the market against you. In fact, at some point last month, 50% of all trades occurred in dark pools or via OTC off exchange trades. Your business strategy is designed intentionally to undermine market transparency and skim profits from companies and other investors. One problem though, Mr. Griffin, is that we don't really know how central your firm has become to the capital markets. Mr. Griffin, does Citadel handle 47% of the US listed retail volume? Please, yes or no. Excuse me, uh, Chairman Waters, what, what percentage? I couldn't hear that number. 47%. So Chairman Waters, to the best yes, of all, uh, so the odd, to the best of my knowledge, we handle in excess of roughly 40% of all retail volume. Thank you very much for reclaiming my time. Mr. Griffin, on January 27, the Citadel execute 7.4 billion shares for retail investors, which would be more trades than the average daily volume of the entire United States equities market in 2019, yes or no? Uh, Chairman Waters, that was my written and oral testimony. Thank you very much. Uh, and with that, I now recognize the distinguished ranking member, Mr. McHenry, for five minutes for questions. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Tanev, I'm gonna come to you first. Uh, I, I just wanna get to what happened on that day in January. So let's take a step back here. You get a call in the middle of the night, according to what I've heard uh, you in interviews say, and based off that conversation with your compliance team, you decided to halt the buying of GameStop stock. Uh, people were furious. Um, we'll get into the regulations and the settlement parts of that uh, today. We will get to that. But there's this is what I, I think needs to be answered about your decision. Why did Robinhood restrict the buying but not the selling of GameStop? And why did folks get locked out on the buy side only? Ranking member McHenry, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to address that. Uh, the reason that Robinhood, first of all, let me say Robinhood is always committed to providing access. It's in our name. It's in everything that we do. Uh, the decision to restrict GameStop and other securities was driven purely by deposit and collateral requirements imposed by our clearing houses. So, uh, buying, uh, oh, buying why, securities. But why? Buying securities why, and pieces are buying. requirements. Selling does not. Moreover, uh, preventing customers from selling is a very difficult and painful experience where customers are unable to access their money. So we don't want to impose that type of experience on our customers unless we have no other choice. And even though I recognize customers were very upset and disappointed that we had to do this, I imagine it would have been significantly worse if we prevented customers from selling. Okay, so let me ask this question. Is payment for order flow legal? Yes, payment for order flow is legal and, and regulated and in the common disclosed? industry. And is this disclosed to uh, those users of your app? Yes, payment for order flow is disclosed in multiple places. And moreover, payment okay. for order flow enables commission-free trading. And that's why it's become the industry standard model as other brokerages have replicated our model and started offering commission-free trading to their customers as well. Okay, so, so to, that, to, to this greater point of what happened that day and the model that you're using, uh, let's be crystal clear. That decision you made to restrict the buying but not the selling of GameStop 
was based what was it based on pressure from anyone on the witness panel here today not at all zero pressure from anyone it was a collateral depository requirement decision made by our robin hood securities president all right so let me get into this other question let me get in this question you want to democratize uh finance you want to open up uh, uh, Wall Street to retail investors. You say that Robin Hood's mission is to democratize finance for all. So let's talk about that. So yes or no, uh, can a Robin Hood customer invest in Robin Hood the company? Robin Hood's currently a private company, so that, that's not possible, no. Uh, and so you, you mean to tell me that the people that use your platform that make you a successful company, and I would say directly contribute to your company's exponential growth and success, they don't get the same access to equity shares as a Robinhood employee or your institutional investors. Is that correct? Currently, that is correct, yes. All right, Ms. Schultz, let me pivot to you. Why is that? Why is, why is it that everyday investors on the Robinhood app uh, people that I would argue contributed to its success can't invest in Robinhood itself. The SEC limits a lot of investment in private companies to those folks that are known as accredited investors. And to become an accredited investor, you have to have a wealth, meet a wealth test of earning at least $200,000 a, a year um, or having a net worth of over a million dollars. Um, the vast majority of people in this country don't meet that standard and are unable to invest in most private companies. Okay, so let me let me just clear this. Uh, Mr. Tenev, I don't blame you for, for the restriction you've put on your customers not being able to invest in equity. I'd like to have more opportunity to ask Mr. Gill his thoughts on this, but let me just say this. I don't, I don't fault you for the inequitable regulatory structure that DC has created. Uh, but I think we need to clear this up. Final thing, Madam Chair, I have a, 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 for the record, I'd like to submit a letter from the DTCC, which is the clearing company uh, that, that uh, was not on the panel today. Uh, and uh, your staff has this uh, With uh, letter. Order. All right. Thank you all. And look forward to getting to the facts. From matter from, today. Uh, other members, Ms. Maloney. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Waters uh, and uh, Ranking Member McHenry for convening this hearing. I, I hope today's hearing sheds light on how our markets are working, or in many cases are not working, for smaller investors and ways we can fix that. The events of late January saw tremendous volatility and stock prices that were totally divorced from market fundamentals. The whole enterprise was viewed by some as a giant video game trading stocks instead of properties and monopoly money. But it's not all fun and games because people can lose their life savings, their hard earned cash, and tragically, last summer we know of at least one suicide linked to potential trading losses. Beyond those possible losses, the actions of Robinhood and other trading platforms during the GameStop frenzy caused confusion, anger, and undermined investor confidence in the fundamental fairness of our capital markets. None of this is healthy for our markets or good for investors. What makes markets work fairly is when everyone knows the rules and that the rules remain consistent and predictable and are enforced. But because of Robin Hood's actions, too many customers did not get that predictability. Many retail investors woke up on January 28th to find that they could no longer buy and sell stocks the same way they could the days prior. And they were being treated differently than other market participants who could still buy and sell those same stocks. So I don't blame them for thinking that things were stacked against the little guy. Mr. Tenev, you stated in your testimony that Robinhood restricted trading for certain securities, including GameStop, in order to meet your financial requirements with your clearinghouse. But when I go to Robinhood's website and the blog post you initially released on January 28, your financial requirements with your clearinghouse are not mentioned. You only mention market volatility. 
And when I review the Robinhood customer agreement, you don't include specifics on how and when you may decide to, to, res to restrict trading, which you did. And you don't include any language or disclosures regarding your capital requirements. It only includes vague language that at any time and in its sole discretion, Robinhood can restrict trading. In other words, you seem to reserve the right to make up the rules as you go along. So I, I have two questions for you. First, do you think you owe your customers more disclosure and transparency than you gave them? And second, do you believe your lack of candor with your customers might have contributed to the wild speculation and confusion that resulted in the aftermath of your trading restrictions? Congresswoman, I appreciate the question. Um, so to answer the second question, look, I'm sorry for what happened. Um, I apologize. And I'm not going to say that Robin Hood did everything perfect and that we haven't made mistakes in the past. But what, what I commit to is making sure that we improve from this, we learn from it, and we don't make the same mistakes in the future. And Robinhood as an organization will learn from this and improve to make sure it doesn't happen again. And I'll make sure of that. Well, I expect we will experience future events with increased volatility and Robinhood's recent actions appeared arbitrary, is, which is why I don't blame customers for feeling treated unfairly. Your, your trading restrictions came out of the blue and your communication was not clear. So my next question, Mr. Tenev, looking forward, what operational changes is Robinhood making to better respond to future market volatility, to improve transparency with your customers, and to ensure retail customers don't get the rug pulled out from under them at the last minute? Thank you for that question, Congresswoman. We'll be committing to reviewing absolutely everything about this. Uh, the $3.4 billion that we raised, I think, goes a long way to cushioning the firm from future market volatility and other similar black swan events. And uh, I believe that even throughout this process, we improved our risk management processes and strengthened them so that the experience customers had on Friday of that week was much improved from Thursday. Thank you. And we'll continue to learn and, and improve upon this. Ms. Wagner, you're recognized for Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'd like to welcome our witnesses for testifying today to discuss the late January market volatility that took place, along with what I hope is a broader discussion on market functions and their effect on everyday investors. Since I was very first elected, I have advocated for America's Main Street investors and worked tirelessly to ensure that all Americans, especially those low and middle income savers, are given the investment choice, access, and affordability that they deserve. Retail investors are the strength of our stock market, and I have fought throughout my career for their best interests in the financial markets, and this hearing today is no different. The advances in financial technology that we've witnessed in the last decade have improved the way that Americans and our businesses perform financial activities. In just the past year, we have seen retail investors market participation more than double. And I think this is great. I believe in the wisdom of the retail investor. And I will say, I believe in the first amendment too. Uh, this increase is attributed uh, to Robinhood and other trading brokerages who are lowering account minimums, permitting fractional share trading and implementing zero commission trading. It's critical that um, Congress focus on reducing barriers, reducing barriers to market participation, which is rarely, uh, or rarely want to do, let me sadly say, and allowing Main Street uh, Americans access to the financial instruments that can create long-term investment savings. All of these changes have given millions of Americans the ability to invest uh, better for their families and their future. My hope 
is that the majority does not use this hearing as an excuse to once again add new federal regulatory burdens to an industry that is already heavily regulated uh, that will prevent people from participating in our capital markets. Letting existing regulations work is key, not burdening everyday investors with new and more costly barriers to entry. Mr. Tanev, it appears at the time your company did not have enough money to meet the collateral requirements for that level of trading by your customers. In your view, A, were collateral requirements by from the DTCC unreasonably high? Was the amount of trading on your platform unforeseeable? Or was your company undercapitalized given its risk profile? Thank you for the question, Congresswoman. So uh, this event, was a five sigma event, which is a one in 3.5 million event. To put that in context, there have only been tens of thousands of stock market days in the history of the US stock market. So a one in 3.5 million event basically is unmodelable. That said, we can learn from it. And in this particular case, our risk management processes worked appropriately to keep us in compliance with all of our deposit requirements and collateral requirements. Well, Mr. Tev, I, I realize that you are doing a full review of your practices and such. Um, um, I encourage you to do that. And certainly communication with your investors is gonna be key to that because you didn't communicate with them early on. Let me just say, as the ranking member uh, on the Diversity and Inclusion Subcommittee, I am delighted to be speaking with our witness, Ms. Jennifer Schulp. Ranking member McHenry and I have spent countless hours stressing the importance of having qualified women in finance. So I'm pleased to have you here today to lend your expertise. Ms. Schulp, we now know that it was the daily collateral demands set by the National Security Clearing uh, Corporation that were the reason Robinhood had to temporarily restrict trading. Can you briefly explain the purpose of these capital requirements and their overall relationship to ensuring our markets function in an orderly manner? And did you see any broad failures of market function during these events, ma'am? Sure, thank you. Um, thank you for the compliment. Um, the SCC's collateral requirements here serve the function to, to provide security for the stock settlement process goes through. So while an investor thinks that what has happened is they bought a stock on the day that they, they make a trade, it really takes two days for the settlement process to clear. During that time, the brokerage firm, the DTCC, and the brokerage firm on the other side can remain at risk of that stock not actually clearing. And the collateral requirements are in place in order to mitigate and mitigate the risk that the brokerage firm will not be able to make good on its promises to sell or buy. Um, I didn't see any broad scale failure here. Um, the DTCC's collateral requirement was large, but understandable. And I, I think things functioned largely correctly. My, my time has expired. Um, I thank you all for your testimony, and I yield back, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, thank you, Madam, Madam Chairman. Madam Mr. Chairman, point, point of order. Uh, I just like, yeah, Perlmutter, just uh, to remind people to, when they're not speaking, to uh, mute themselves because there's a lot of feedback when the question is asked and the mic stays open and the people are answering the question. Just remind everybody, mute when you're not speaking, that's all. Thank you very much. You heard Mr. Perlmutter. Uh, I would hope that every member uh, would uh, certainly do that. Mr. Sherman, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, we've come to expect things on the internet to be free. When you're not paying for it, it's not free. You're the product, someone else is the customer. When you go onto Facebook and it's free, you're the product being sold uh, to the advertiser and your information is sold to God knows whom. So we now have a system where we're telling investors that it's free to invest uh, in to buy and sell stock. Uh, there are two ways to pay the folks involved in Wall Street for buying and selling stock. One is a commission, and uh, you know what it is. 
And so we discourage investors a little bit from buying and selling stock because they have to pay a commission and they know they're paying a commission. The other way to do it is to give them a worse um, uh, 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 execution. So whenever there's a, say, a stock being purchased and sold, the market maker, perhaps Citadel, might be uh, willing to sell the stock for ten, uh, for uh, ten dollars and five cents, uh, but uh, will buy it for only ten dollars. The difference is five cents. And so the issue is whether Robinhood and other people who are been to being told you get it for free are really getting it for free. Uh, Mr. Griffin, you're a market maker. You pay uh, some brokers for order flow. You pay other. You don't pay other order uh, others for order flow. Um, so when you pay for order flow, you're not making as much on the transaction. You have to pay some of that back to the broker. That's hidden for the amount of that is hidden from the customer. The fact that it exists says perhaps recently been disclosed. Uh, SEC rules require that people get the best execution, but I've recently learned that there's best execution and enhanced pricing. So if you get an order from Fidelity and you get an order from uh, Robinhood and you're paying for the Robinhood order flow, is that customer getting, is the Robinhood customer getting as good a price as the Fidelity customer? Mr. Griffin. So, Congressman, I, I believe that's an excellent question. The execution quality that we can provide as measured in terms of price improvement is heavily related or correlated to the size of the order that we receive. So, if I were to speculate. I, I didn't, don't, don't tell me that it's, a, that there are other factors involved and take us down another road. I'm asking you a clear question. Assuming same size of order, one comes in from Robin Hood, one comes in from Fidelity. Uh, is is it not true that one is going to be get a enhanced uh, uh, best execution, and the other one is just going to get best best execution? So as as I was trying to explain, because the Robin Hood order comes from a community, a community of traders who tend to trade in smaller size. That isn't my question, sir. You're evading my question by making up other questions. Let me repeat. Two identical orders come in. Same stock, same quantity. One's from Robinhood, one's from Fidelity. What happens? The quality of the execution varies by the channel of the order. This is a commonly understood phenomenon in economics that channels matter. So, for example, when you go get a mortgage, a mortgage from JP Morgan to their clientele has a different rate of interest than a mortgage. Okay, let me reclaiming my time, sir. Who gets the better deal? The one that comes from a broker who is uh, paying, uh, being paid for order flow, and one not. Can you testify that they, that on balance there is no difference, assuming the same size of the order? So, as I said earlier, size of the order is only one factor. Other you are factors, doing a great job of wasting my time. You should, might, if you're going to filibuster, you should run for the Senate. Uh, everyone else I've talked to in this industry says when you pay for order flow, you get a, uh, when your broker is being paid for order flow, you get a worse execution. Uh, and uh, uh, otherwise, you're in a peculiar circumstance where you're making uh, more money on a Fidelity uh, transaction uh, than a Robinhood transaction, which would be an absurd business uh, uh, practice. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Lucas, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, thank Madam you. Chairman, for holding this hearing, and thank you to the witnesses for agreeing to testify. It's been reported that approximately 20% of market volume is now attributable to retail customers, which I think is just fascinating considering that's up from 10% in 2019. And that's an overwhelmingly positive development, allowing for more market liquidity, more stability, additional avenues for households to grow their wealth. And it's important to increase market access for retail customers. 
and I don't want to disrupt that if we possibly can. So I'd like to turn with my first question uh, to Mr. Tenniff. Let's let's talk about uh, the attention that this pay for order flow has received. You explained in your testimony, Robinhood's relationship with market makers is important for Robinhood's ability to offer commission-free trading. So expand, if you would, on how that how that process benefits the everyday investor. And just expand in general on that, if you would. Congressman, I'd be happy to. Thanks for, for giving me an opportunity. So as I mentioned uh, in my written testimony, payment for order flow enables commission-free trading. Prior to Robinhood changing the industry standard model to be commission-free, most brokers collected a commission on top of the payment for order flow on every transaction. Now, Robinhood routes to market makers, including Citadel Execution Services. We've got seven in total across equities and options. And we route without consideration for payment for order flow. All payment for order flow arrangements are uniform across the market makers. And our system routes orders based on who provides the best execution quality for our customers. So the reason Citadel gets a relatively high percentage of our customer order flow is because they provide superior execution quality for our customers. And that's first and foremost, the most important consideration that we look for. How are customers getting the best execution quality? If another market maker were to improve upon the execution quality that Citadel Execution Services provides on any subset of orders, our system is set up to automatically route more traffic to that market maker. Continuing down this line, because clearly this is one of the things that my colleagues and the public has a very strong interest in. Uh, and having lived through Dodd-Frank before, I see where sometimes major things can occur. I want to turn to Mr. Griffin. Now, could you also elaborate on how payment for order flow provides uh, uh, whether it's the best price to the retail investor from the market maker's perspective. Could you expand on that? Uh, as you outlined in. Absolutely, Congressman. So as the CEO, CEO of Robinhood just set forth clearly, the orders that are allocated amongst the market makers today are allocated principally on the basis of price improvement. We have fought for 15 years to make that the basis by how which orders are allocated because we strongly believe that Citadel is able to provide a better execution for retail orders in the long run. We make a huge investment in our team and our technology to do so. How is it that we are able to provide better execution quality than exchanges? Because exchanges are limited in their ability to do business by regulatory mandate. Exchanges by law have a minimum one cent wide market, which for low price securities means that they are less competitive than they otherwise could be. We're able- to Noah, are you here and what are you doing? Excuse me? That wasn't either one of us. Continue, Mr. Griffin. All right. So we're able to share our trading acumen with retail investors and we're able to give them a better price and we're able to make payments for order flow to firms like Robinhood that allow them to have lower or today in most cases no commission and of particular note we're able to help Robinhood and other brokers pay exchange fees to the exchanges at the time of execution this has been very important to the democratization of finance it has allowed the American retail investor to have the lowest execution cost they've ever had in the history of the U.S. financial market. Mr. Tenev, in the Dodd-Frank process that the chairman and I went through a decade ago plus, there was much discussion about margin requirements. Give us just a discussion for an instant about when you discovered you had a $3, million, $3 billion additional margin call. So, um, thank you, Congressman. Uh, I believe the full play-by-play -play -play of, of that situation was described in detail in my written testimony. Um, just to clarify, though, this decision had and nothing to do with margin. Expired, unfortunately. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Has expired. Mr. Meeks, you're recognized for five minutes. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for this hearing and Mr. Ranking uh, Member. Uh, let me ask a, a question to Mr. Tanev. Um, you know, I, I've been burnt once or twice uh, in the market, and uh, uh, but particularly since I've been a member of Congress, one of the things uh, that I recall uh, greatly was the financial the, uh, crises uh, in 2008. Uh, and it is, you know, we thought that opening the market up, but people had uh, adjustable rate mortgages, et cetera, they were able to get into the market, people may, who may not have been before, but a lot of disclosure had not happened. So they didn't look, nor was there, there was no documents uh, to look at what their incomes were or anything of that nature. So when those adjustable rates happened, many individuals lost their homes, many people who bought those mortgages or who, who initially uh, 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 agreed to those mortgages, sold them immediately because they did know that the people would not be able to afford them and they would default shortly thereafter. Now, so I understand your model of trying to get more people, more democratization, but that means that there's a great, uh, now greater responsibility of ensuring that your customers have all of the information they need to ask, to assess riskier trades. Now, what for me, the information that needs to be has to be digestible and accessible. Now, one of the problems I have, for example, you're allowing up to one thousand dollars to buy stocks on margin, and borrowing on margin is risky. So, how do you disclose this? How do you make the term, determination of individuals uh, who are not the sophisticated investors by and allowing them to buy these risky uh, uh, stocks that are on margin? Thank you, Congressman, for the opportunity to address that. Let me set the stage a little bit by saying that about 2% of our customers borrow on margin, about 13% on a monthly basis perform an options transaction, and a much smaller number, around 3%, perform a multi-leg options transaction. So the vast majority of our customers are engaging in buy and hold activities and long-term investing um, on our platform. Now, to clarify your point on the $1,000 um, margin, that's actually uh, something that we refer to as Robinhood Instant, and it's provided as a courtesy. When a customer initiates a deposit, we allow them access to up to $1,000 of that deposit immediately, similar to how if you deposit a check at a bank, uh, as a courtesy, they might provide access to that to those funds or a portion of them before that check clears. Uh, as for margin specifically, borrowing money on margin, um, the rules are very ironclad industry-wide. Uh, obviously, Robinhood Securities conforms to, to all the applicable rules. And uh, Robinhood's product is in many ways more restrictive than that of our competitors because in order to even qualify for borrowing on margin, you have to be a Robinhood Gold customer which involves uh, paying $5 a month for the service. So I think that you have, you know, you say that the, everything is restrictive, but when you are going after the, the less sophisticated investor, it's more than that. There's a greater responsibility that you have because they have, uh, they could lose. And when they lose, uh, it could make a deter determination of whether or not they can pay their mortgage or their rent or not. Uh, and they can be taken advantage of. Oftentimes we find in the financial industry, it is those that have the lease that are really taken advantage of. So the big guys, you know, it becomes a reverse Robin Hood situation, which is really, which really concerns me. Let me get to this real quick because I was just something else that you said uh, in regards to liquidity. Uh, and you said that you didn't borrow the money in because you, uh, because you needed it. Uh, at the time, uh, but that then you later in a question you you ask what did they do um, that you raise the additional money because I want to know how you spent the money for future situations, which means to me that you did have a liquidity problem or you anticipated possibly having a liquidity problem or would have one in future uh, transactions. Could you could you what's the deal there? I, I appreciate that question. Uh, I stand by what I said. Robinhood was able to meet our deposit requirements. We were in compliance with firm net capital obligations throughout the period. 
and that additional capital, the 3.4 billion, wasn't to service our requirements. It was entirely to prepare for a future even greater uh, black swan event and to unrestrict and remove restrictions on, on the trading and the buying of these securities. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Heisinger, you're next with uh, five minutes. Thanks, Madam Chair. And uh, this would have been a little nicer 10 minutes ago when I was supposed to go, but I'm gonna go back to Mr. Griffin um, and uh, the chair of the Capital Markets Subcommittee. Ranking member, uh, I think, was filibustering himself. And I just wanted to make sure, Mr. Griffin, you had uh, that opportunity to feel comfortable with the explanation of, of that best X execution and what uh, what was attempted, apparently, uh, to try to be asked. Congressman, I, I, I hope so. I think it's important to emphasize that we have vigorously advocated for execution quality to be one of the dominant decision-making factors in the routing of order flow in the United States. This has saved retail investors billions of dollars over the year in contrast to the executions that they would receive through other execution strategies. Okay. With respect to payment for order flow, we simply play by the rules of the road. Payment for order flow has been expressly approved by the SEC. It is a customary practice within the industry if they choose to change the rules of the road, we need to drive on the left side versus the right side. That's fine with us. I do believe that payment for order flow has been an important source of innovation in the industry. As the CEO Robin has testified, they drove the industry towards $0 commissions. This has been a big yep. win for American investors. We get to uh, uh, Mish, uh, Sculp, uh from uh, from Cato Institute. Um, and, and I know that there was a Greenwich Associates uh, had a study and others are out there. Uh, do you concur that this has been good for consumers in the most part? I think that there's still ongoing studies, but I, I do think that the payment for order flow and the price improvements have largely been good for improvements for customers. And I, I agree with Mr. Griffin that this has helped drive innovation in the industry. Uh, I think disclosure can always be better. And I think people should understand that their broker still needs to make money, even if they're providing a zero commission trading service. Yeah, okay. All right, um, I've got about three minutes left. Um, I was gonna start actually with this and ask each one of you why you thought you were here today. Uh, but I'm gonna dispense with that because it's gonna take too much time and I'll provide the answer political theater for the most part. Uh, that's uh, that's what this hearing is today. I mean, we're on the uh, business channels right now and on C-SPAN. I think if you see a few of my colleagues playing to the cameras, but we need to have some of these fundamental and important questions answered uh, at the end of the day. And one of the assertions that you've heard already today is that that investing is quote, casino gambling, it's using monopoly funny money, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I guess I want to know, is retail, individual retail participation in the marketplace, gambling, casino gambling, or uh, using funny money? Mr. Gill, why don't we just start with you? Very quickly. Uh, I don't hear him. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Huffman, let's move to you. No, I believe that investing is investing. Okay. Uh, Mr. Griffin. I believe the vast, vast majority of retail participation are people saving to meet their dreams. All right, Mr. Tenev. Congressman, thank you. As I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, Robinhood customers have essentially made over $35 billion in unrealized and realized gains Very on quick. all of their it's, assets. It's, it's, it's a thing for them, correct? A absolutely, it's investing and it's building Let's wealth. Go back to Mr. Gill. Gil? Yes, of course, I, 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 do, I believe it's an opportunity for investors to participate in the market just as institutionals participate. Okay, so actually the uh, business channels had a good question from one of the Reddit readers, which is, so, you recommended uh, GameStop uh, before. Would you buy their stock now at roughly 45? It started at 48 earlier today. You were talking about buying it and being happy uh, when it hit cross 20. So are you buying that stock today? 
Well, let me just say that in investing can be risky, and my particular approach to investing is rather aggressive and may not be suitable for anyone else. But for me personally, yes. <laughs> So yes or no, are you buying the stock? And for me well, personally, yes, I do find it's an attractive investment so at this price point. Quick question. Uh, did you invest in GameStop uh, uh, because you were not aware of the uh, uh, of uh, payment for order flow? That's one of the accusations. Because they don't know that. Sorry, could you repeat that question? <laughs> did you buy GameStop uh, because you we're not aware of the payment for order flow. My investment in GameStop was based on the fundamentals. Okay, I think that that, that answers it. I believe my time has expired. Ms. Velasquez, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chair, uh, Chairwoman. Uh, Mr. Tenet, okay. Robinhood seems to have perfected the gamification of trading, providing the user with the perception that investing through the Robinhood app offers recreational gain, playing with little or no downside risk. Of course, many of us understand that investing is not a game and carries significant risk. How does Robinhood balance disclosures around the potential downside risk of investing including the risk of substantial loss and the more enticing claims of profitability and the ease of trading. Con Congresswoman, I appreciate that question. Giving people what they want in a responsible way is what Robinhood is about. We don't consider that gamification. We know that investing is serious and we're investing in all of the educational tools and customer support to help people on their investing journey. What we see is most of our customers are buy and hold. A very small percentage are trading options, about 13%, and less than 3% uh, borrow on margin. So most people use Robinhood to build up portfolios over time. And but can you answer my question? How does, do you balance disclosures? around the potential downside uh, risk of in so we we make lots of lots of disclosures congresswoman lots. Uh, we mm -hmm. also um we're also a self-directed brokerage so that means we don't provide advice and we don't make recommendations for what customers should or should not invest in so you don't think that uh, as a result of the uh emphasizing profitability and ease of trading over the risk of loss that many investor amateur investors were on a, unaware of the situation they currently find themselves in well i i want to mention again as in my opening statement um robin hood customers have have earned more than 35 billion dollars in uh, in unrealized and realized gains on top of what they've deposited. So I think this shows us that the product is working for customers and our mission is working. Okay, thank you. Mr. Larkin, over the course of my time in Congress, I have been concerned and spoken out about the dangers of short selling. While I understand that short selling can be used for legitimate purposes, too often I have seen abuse and it ends up harming ordinary workers and families. I first saw it against the people of Puerto Rico and now we are seeing it here against GameStop. Large investors, including hedge funds like yours, have to disclose their long positions when they own 5% or more of the company's shares, but not such disclosure is required for short positions. As we consider reforms, is this type of disclosure for short positions something you will support? Mr. 
Mr. Plotkin. Yeah, Congresswoman, uh, thank you very much for the question. I think it's a really good question. Um, you know, whatever regulation is put forth in the marketplace, we will obviously, you know, operate within those rules. Um, it, it's certainly something I'd be happy to follow up with. A but what about that? The, the, my question about short selling? Yeah, I, I think it's a really good question. You know, it, it's not mm -hmm. really for me to decide, but if those are the rules, I'll certainly abide by them. Okay, well, I'm, uh, it's, I'm glad to hear that answer. Uh, Mr. Deal, public reports credit you with helping to start the GameStop craze by encouraging other amateur investors to bet against the short positions that Mr. Plotkin and others took. But the stock has now fallen from its high, and many amateur investors have lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. It is my understanding that you are a registered broker. Is that correct? The gentleman's time has expired. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. And I appreciate all of the members who are participating today. This is not political theater at all. This is serious oversight responsibility and members are reminded not to impugn the motive of other members. Thank you, Mr. Lukemeyer. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, my first question will go to Mr. Gill. Um, Mr. Gill, you know, I, I guess the question is, uh, you're a very uh, serious investor, somebody who does his homework, uh, invests in the market, your own personal funds, uh, and, and so I guess the question would be here today, we're discussing the actions around Robinhood, all the transactions that took place. Uh, and I guess, do you think we need more legislation as a result of what happened here or did the system actually work? And let me just make a couple of comments on that part. From the standpoint that did it work, was it self-correcting? Did the, the fact that uh, somebody like yourself was able to invest and maybe take advantage of the overshorting positions by the hedge fund guys who were trying to really drive down the price of the stock for other reasons, whatever, or did it point out perhaps that we had some companies perhaps like Robinhood, I would argue that was undercapitalized or underreserved, um, or maybe there was over aggressive other types of investing that would uh, that was taking place, the algorithms that were there, the different business models, they didn't work because you outsmarted the system, so to speak, uh, would you like to comment on that, on those, on that sort of uh, questions and how I formatted that? Thank you for the question, Congressman. I would say my expertise is in analyzing the business, the fundamentals of the business, not so much on the inner workings of the market. Um, I'm not so sure about legislation per se. What I would say is that increased transparency could help. That if someone like me could have a better understanding of how those types of things work, I feel as though it would be quite beneficial to retail investors. Thank you for that. I know that, um, uh, Mr. Tevin, uh, you know, Robin Hood has an interesting name. Uh, as I recall, the old uh, story is take from the rich, uh, give to the poor. And I assume what you're doing is allowing the poor to compete with the, uh, the, the rich, which is interesting. Uh, you made the comment in your testimony, Mr. Tevin, uh, about uh, settling this in real time. We had the electronic ability to do this. Um, I think that would, will probably help the situation that occurred here, but what other problems occur when you do this in real time? What other things would we have to look at? Uh, what other unintended consequences would there be if you did something like that? Thank you, Congressman, for the question. Um, I believe that right now, certain market participants rely on uh, next day settlement to, um, to be able to take advantage of intraday netting and uh, run up larger one-sided positions in certain stocks with the knowledge that they can close those positions or reduce them by the time settlement happens. Um, and I understand that would be a limitation to the trading activities of, of some of these institutions. So that's certainly one area to consider. The other is around securities lending. It would have to, we'd have to make, uh, make changes to how securities lending works. Um, I don't think any of these are insurmountable challenges, and I'd be happy, as I mentioned earlier, to deploy um, our intellectual capital and our team's engineering resources to, to help solve these problems very quickly. Thank you for that. Um, Mr. Plotkin and Mr. Griffin, uh, the question is for both of you here. Um, whenever you're short selling, I understand that GameStop stock was short sold 140%. 
Um, and Mr. Uh, Plotkin, you made the comment in your testimony a minute ago that you were not trying to manipulate stock. Yet, if you're if you're short selling a stock 140 um, percent, for me on the outside looking in, it looks like that's exactly what you're doing. Explain to me why that's not manipulating a stock. Uh, thank you, uh, Congressman. Uh, you know, for us. Um, I can't speak to other people that were shorted. Anytime we short a stock, we we locate a borrow. Uh, our systems actually force us to find a borrower. So we always, you know, short stocks within the context of all the rules. Mr. Griffin, would you like to comment on that? You, know, you guys are both market makers and you know brokers and hedge fund guys. I mean, you do all of it. Uh, why are you not? Why is this not considered manipulating a stock whenever you can short sell at one hundred and forty percent? Don't you think there should be a limit on something like that? So I believe that the short interest in GameStop was was exceptional. And I, I'm not sure it's worth us delving into legislative corrections for a, a very unique situation in terms of the extreme size of the short interest. I will say that all of the large markets, in fact, every bank, every hedge fund does have to comply with the requirement to borrow shares to short shares in the course of their day in and day out business. The practice of naked shorting was, was largely curtailed by SEC mandate years ago. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Scott, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Lady Waters. And let me just say, Chair Lady, that the people of this country appreciate you for pulling this financial services here and together because this is a threat to the future of our financial system and we got to get to the bottom of it. Let me start with you, uh, Mr. Tenney. Let's go through this. The sequence of events that led to the extreme rise in value of GameStop stock and the subsequent market volatility originated through a Reddit discussion. And then that was fueled through social media. And as the story gained traction, treats by well-known figures with the influence to move markets set the stock value even higher and higher. So let me start with you, Mr. Tenney. What policies does Robin Hood have in place to monitor what happened on social media and how it drives the use of your trading platforms? Thank you for the, the question, Congressman. Um, currently, Robin Hood does not perform any sort of moderation of social media. Um, we simply don't have the data that the social media platforms have at their disposal to tie these posts to identities. We do, however, within Robinhood Securities, um, conform to all regulatory requirements uh, around monitoring and trade surveillance and all, all things of that nature. Well, Mr. Kenner, don't you see something has gone terribly wrong here? What do you do to monitor the trades in individual stocks, particularly when in the case of GameStop, they are singled out and moved on social media. What do you do? I, I appreciate the question. So our, our priority throughout um, the exceptional market conditions in January and, and early February was to maintain the uptime and performance of our platform and make sure that we're available to customers. Let me try to get to a point here. Do you, Robin Hood, do you have any policies in place to ensure that investors are making trades based on legitimate material financial information and not the influence of social media, the design of trading platforms, or any other superfluous information. Do you have Absolutely. anything, any guard to that? Absolutely. Uh, Congressman, we provide educational resources to our customers, including our redesigned Robinhood Learn portal, 
which is not just available to Robinhood customers, but to the general public and had over 3.2 million people visiting uh, in 2020. But don't so we really, need, do we not? I mean, you're at the center of this. We got, don't you see and agree that something very wrong happened here? And that you are at the center of it, and you, we are looking on this committee of how we can protect our wonderful, precious financial system. We need it from you. Is there? What about you, Mr. Hoffman? Do you have anything? Uh, what steps is your company taking to guard against this? Anything at all? Congressman, we spend a lot of time at Reddit ensuring the authenticity of our platform. So we've got a large team dedicated to this exact task. Everything on Reddit, all of the content is created by users, voted on by users and ranked by users. And we make sure that that is authentic and as unmanipulated as possible. And in this specific case, we did not see any signs of manipulation. Madam, Madam Chairman, lady, I just want to conclude. I got maybe 10 seconds left, but this episode exposes a serious threat to our financial system when tweets, social media posts do more to move the market than material legitimate information. The risk is enormous. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Stivers, you now have five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate, I appreciate you calling this hearing. The American financial markets, I believe, are the envy of the world, but they're still imperfect. I would have liked to see this committee have a meaningful discussion about capital requirements and the T plus two clearing rules that may have contributed to some of Robin Hood's customers not being able to purchase stock, including GameStop, for a period of time. But because the majority didn't include the SEC, the Depository Trust Clearing Corporation, or the National Securities Clearing Corporation to testify, we're left with what we have. Uh, that's because I believe the majority is attempting to use this hearing to drive a narrative about the U.S. capital markets being rigged. But I do have several questions. Uh, Mr. Tanev, Tanev, you decided uh, to stop uh, allowing your users to buy GameStop and other stocks as a result of capital requirements on Robinhood securities. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Deposit requirements with our clearing houses. And, and you know, those got resolved, but for a period of time, uh, some of your users could only sell and not buy, and that could have contributed to uh, the stock actually going you know, not, not going up as fast because some of your users were prohibited from buying. Uh, is, do you think that is uh, possible that that could have happened? I, I shouldn't speculate on what could have happened if- If there's um, more sellers than buyers, does the stock price go down or up? Well, to be clear, Robinhood, Congressman, is a minority of trading I, activity I in, um, in these securities. I understand, but if, if your buyers can only sell and not buy, then it, it clearly uh, keeps you from putting upward pressure on the stock price. Is that correct? On on Thursday, users, customers on our platform could only sell. So there was, there was no ability to buy. That's correct. Great. So, uh, you know, I know, and you said earlier, uh, by the way, I know some people have attacked your arbitration agreements, uh, but I want you to be clear. If your users were harmed, um, as a result of these actions, they can recover through arbitration. Is that correct? Yes or no? Yes, that's correct. And our arbitration is FINRA supervised and, and, and overseen. And we do believe arbitration gives customers a fair and speedy, speedier resolution to, to their claims. Thank you. Does, does, that, does your user agreement and your arbitration allow for group arbitration or only individual arbitration? Let me get back if, to you on that. If one. a group was treated similarly and similarly affected or lost upside or lost money, can they do it as a group or is it only individual in your arbitration agreement? Well, Congressman, I'm sure you're you're familiar of the 
number of class action lawsuits filed against Robin. And I'm not for, asking about a class action lawsuit. I'm, I'm asking in your arbitration system, can a, can a group of people come together or as an individual? And this is not a trick question. Uh, I'm not a fan of trial lawyers. I'm just trying to understand. Yeah, I appreciate the, the question, Congressman. I think the best thing I can do is get back to you after okay. making sure that Thank we get you the right answer. Thank you. Thank you. That'd be helpful. Mr. Plotkin, uh, are you a frequent short seller? Yes or no? Uh, and we run a long short portfolio. The majority of our investments are long investments, but we also have short investments to hedge out market risk. Thank you, Mr. Plotkin. Has Melvin Capital ever engaged in short selling of the stock Tesla? Uh, we have been short Tesla in the past. That's correct. Uh, Mr. Block, and also, this is a longer question. Did you see the tweet from uh, Tesla CEO Elon Musk about GameStop stock? I did see that after market hours on, uh, yes, on a Tuesday. Do you believe that Mr. Musk's tweet had any significant effect of driving the rise in GameStop stock? I don't want to speculate on what the actions of his tweet were. The stock did rise I'm after all. this. Then, do you believe that that tweet was targeting you because you had shorted Tesla stock in the past? Uh, you know, we had a very small short position years ago in Tesla. That would be pure speculation as to his motives of, of putting that tweet out. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, I'll go back to uh, uh, Mr. Tenev on the. Um, on the regulatory requirements, do you believe that uh, the SEC and the Depository Trust Clearing Corporation should modify any of their rules as a result of what happened uh, to your users because of capital requirements? I, I do believe the gentleman's time has expired and the SEC is not here today. Uh, because they're in transition with a temporary chair awaiting the confirmation of the person who's been appointed by the president of the United States. This is a serious hearing. Members are reminded not to impugn the motives of others. Thank you, Mr. Green. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Schultz, um, there is a reason um, for penalizing a market maker for improperly trading its own accounts ahead of its clients' accounts. Note that I said improperly trading. I don't want to go through the scenario of there being a time for proper trading ahead of accounts. I'd like for you to tell us what that reason is, please. Well, trading ahead of customer accounts is, is illegal and it, it does not um, I understand that it's illegal. Yeah. I don't mean to be rude, crude, and unrefined, but I have to ask this question quickly. What can happen to that can benefit the market maker? How can that be monetized such that the market maker profits greatly from doing it? Tell right. If a, if a market maker uh, trades improperly ahead of the own customer accounts, he can get a better price and can move the market in the process depending on how big the trade is, thus hurting the customer. Yes, and, and if this trade is huge and you can see that this trade that um, the client has is huge and will have an impact on the market, um, how does that benefit the market maker to trade ahead of the client? The market maker can get a better price for himself before the, the price changes by the client's trade. Um, he can also engage in self-dealing that way as well. Yeah. So does it benefit a huge market maker to have a great deal with, let's say, a Robin Hood because of the flow that will be coming through that the market maker can take advantage of? I don't think that they're necessarily congruent situations. When you're trading ahead of a customer order, which is something that is illegal and that the SEC does monitor for, it's very different from having knowledge as to the way that the market might be moving well, based I, on- I understand, but I, I wanna talk about the, the circumstance where it's improper, not where it's proper. Remember, we started with improper trading. Here, here's my point. Uh, let me go to it quickly. Um, the market maker Citadel traded over-the-counter stocks for its own accounts in 2012, from 2012 to 2014, while simultaneously delaying client orders for the same shares. 
and it was fine for this. Um, Citadel has been naughty for some time. 2012, pardon me, 2014, uh, Citadel faced $800,000 in penalties. Uh, 2017, $22.6 million. 2018, $3.5 million. 2020, $97 million. Uh, and another 2020 of $700,000. Uh, this seems like a lot of money. It is for me, more than $124 million. But over the same period of time, Citadel had uh, revenues generated in the amount of $13.2 billion. It seems to me that the punishment for these improper trades and improper actions, because it wasn't just trading, uh, Citadel also did some other things that were not proper, they misled clients. Seems that the punishment is so small given the amount of revenue generated over the same period of time. Uh, it seems that Citadel has at least an opportunity to build into its cost of doing business paying penalties. And that concerns me. It concerns me that the punishment doesn't seem to deter Citadel. Uh, it concerns me because I know of circumstances where in persons who are not in the market, uh, they do things that um, are much less harmful and they can possibly go to jail. So the question that I have is this, um, what, what kinds of systems do we have in place, uh, and it's back to you again, ma'am, to prevent the very things that I have called to the attention of my colleagues? Well, as a former enforcement attorney um, at FINRA, I can say that, that regulators have the same concern with fines and other punishments becoming just the cost of doing business. And it's one of the things that are considered along with um, the regulations around, around what can be punished. The gentleman's May I, for the record? Has expired. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Green, as you know, as you know, we're going to have a, a series of hearings and our next panel will include a whole bevy of experts also uh, on some of these issues. With that, Mr. Barger, Mr. Chair, may I say something in the record, please? Uh, I have uh, additional without objection, questions. Without objection, you may enter into the record. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Barr, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam, Madam Chair. And Mr. Griffin, I want to revisit this issue of payment for order flow. Uh, payment for order flow has been around for decades, correct? So I, I know it's been around for at least one or two decades. I, I can't answer before that period of time. And it's it's a recognized uh, and approved practice by the SEC, correct? Yes, it is. And and payment for order flow is set by the brokerage firm, not the wholesaler, right? That I it is ultimately a negotiated number, but it is a number that is set by the broker firm and not by us as the market maker? Uh, well, a as a market maker um, that provides execution services to retail brokers, you are required to meet best execution requirements. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And in other words, market makers are required to provide the same or better pricing than the exchanges, correct? That is correct. And how can market makers offer that better pricing to Mr. Sherman's qu line of questions? So there are a number of drivers that permit us to offer better pricing than what is available on exchange. The first is that exchanges have legally mandated minimum tech sizes of a penny. So if you look at a stock like AMC, it trades $5 bid, 501 offered. If the exchange could trade with a half cent increment, it would probably trade $5.005 bid, 501 offered or vice versa but the exchanges are limited to a one cent minimum tick size. And we have been clear on the record in prior testimony that exchanges should be permitted 
to have a smaller and more competitive tick size. That's fact uh, number one. Okay. Uh, fact number two is that the average retail order is much smaller in totality than the average order that goes on to an exchange. Because this order is smaller, and I'll share a number with you, the typical Robinhood order is ballpark about $2,000 in size. Because it's a small order, the amount of risk that we need to assume in managing that order is relatively small as compared to an order that we have to manage from our on exchange trading. And as I'm sure you're well aware, we are the largest trader of stocks on exchanges in the United States. So we're- So let me, let me move to Mr. Tenev uh, really quickly on that point. Um, what impact might greater restrictions on the payment for order flow model have on your ability to offer zero commission trades? We do believe, uh, Congressman, that that's an important question. And payment for order flow helps cover the costs of running our business and offer commission-free trading to customers. When we started, people didn't even think that there was enough margin left to make this business work, but we've been fortunate to make it work and to make it work for our customers. Well, let's talk about why Robinhood restricted trades. I think your, your explanation about uh, margin requirements uh, charged by your clearinghouse makes sense. Um, is your clear is your clearinghouse supervised by the Fed and the SEC? I, I believe in that. That's are, are, are the margin requirements charged by your clearinghouse in turn approved by the by federal regulators? Yes. Yes. And uh, did did federal regulators uh, approve the value risk charge that was imposed on Robinhood? I believe, Congressman, the value of risk charge is outlined in general terms in Dodd-Frank, um, but I'm not sure who approved the specific implementation of, of that formula. So if anyone has a problem with your decision to halt trades, it's fair to say that their frustration should be directed toward federal regulation. Congressman, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to throw anyone under the bus uh, and direct frustration anywhere. All I can say is Robin Hood Security played this by the books and uh, played it basically the only way that we could remain in compliance Mr. with our deposit requirements. Mr. Plotkin, I uh, appreciate your testimony that Melvin always follows laws governing shorting stock, but Melvin lost $6 billion in 20 trading days. Uh, uh, trading days. Let me ask you about your risk management. Uh, uh, did your short positions exceed float? Uh, no, they did not. Well, shorting has its has an important role to play in our markets, allowing for legitimate hedging and, and price discovery. But we are interested in, in naked shorting, and and so we would hope that uh, that you would uh, clarify that um, and 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 how it is that you make sure uh, that you're first locating the borrow. Right. Time. It's expired, Mr. Cleaver. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I, I, I too would like to thank you for uh, this uh, hearing. Uh, it, it's a question that a lot of people are, are asking, probably many of us as we, uh, you know, go throughout our, our, our districts. Uh, but let, let me start with you, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Tanee. Um, I'm just curious if you can give it to me in a short period of time. How did you come up with your name for the for your uh, the company? Absolutely. Thank you for that question, Congressman. Uh, Robinhood stands for lowering the barrier to entry and democratizing finance for all. So the idea is the same tools that institutions and wealthier high net worth individuals have had for a long time should be available to the people, regardless of their net worth or um, how much money they have. Okay. Uh, I, I appreciate that, 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 uh, the answer, uh, you know, uh, because it's something I would also embrace. Uh, however, I, I have a, a 23 year old uh, on, in, on the other side of the house who I love dearly, uh, but uh, he has no training, no income, no qualifications. How, how in the world could he get like a, a million dollars worth of leverage? Thank you, Congressman. Um, so the leverage that we provide 
to our customers, which less than 3% of our customers actively use is regulated strictly by, by requirements. So the only way to get that amount of leverage in a margin account through borrowing is to deposit a similarly sized amount of, amount of capital. But, uh, uh, or, or by mistake. Congressman, um, I'm not, I'm not sure what you're referring to. Well, I mean, I, there, there's a record of a young man uh, getting a uh, million dollars worth of leverage. Uh, he was uh, uh, 20, only 20 years old. So um, I'm, I'm just saying, you know, if that's not a policy, it was that a mis that was an error. But Congressman, um, I, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to address that really important point. Um, you're referring to Mr. Kearns. I am. The, I am. the, the man who um, unfortunately passed last year. Yes. First of all, uh, I'm sorry to the family of Mr. Kearns for your loss. Uh, the, the passing of Mr. Kearns was deeply troubling to, to me and to the entire to the entire company. And we have vowed to take a series of steps, very aggressive steps to make our options product safer for our customers, including changing the customer interface, uh, adding more additional options education, uh, as well as strengthening and tightening the requirements for people getting options and adding a live customer support line for, for acute options cases. So uh, it was a tragedy and we went into immediate action to make sure that we made not just the most accessible options trading product for our customers, but the safest as well. Okay, I, I, I ask that question. I'm, uh, I, in my real life, I'm a United Methodist pastor, and so I, I, I've read your 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 your, uh, your statement. Uh, you know, after the tragedy of this 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 young twenty year old. Uh, but I mean, and I and I, I I don't think you nor I want to get in. I mean, to to litigate that right here today. Uh, um, uh, but you know, um, what, what what improvements did you make in the aftermath to, to your uh, platform, or did were there improvements? Thank you, Congressman. There were several improvements. One, we added uh, the ability to instant exercise as well as exercise options positions in app. We clarified the display of buying power, specifically negative buying power in situations where um, one leg of a complex multi-leg options transaction were to be assigned. Uh, we also added an options education specialist. We also added live phone-based customer support for uh, acute options cases, which has gotten very, very great feedback from customers and is something we're expanding to other use cases, such as um, cases where customers' accounts have had uh, off-platform uh, hacking incidents. Okay, that, that's the, the the last one is, is where I was I was concentrating on, because um, you know uh, uh, th this young man was trying to get into your system uh, to to find out what was going on. Uh, he was confused. He was scared. And, uh, and so he sent emails. Um, and so, um, you know, and the, the, to be fair, the, there was a response, but it was like, you know, hours, hours later. Uh, uh, and so my, when I, as I became more and more familiar with this particular case. The gentleman's uh, turn has expired. Thank you, Madam, thank you, Madam Chair, I appreciate it. You're so welcome. Mr. Hill, you're recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, for holding this hearing, and I want to thank our witnesses for their expertise and their their patience. Uh, Madam Chair, I have a letter from the American Securities Association I'd like to insert in the record, please. Without objection, such is the order. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Tenev, uh, what a treat to see you, and congratulations on being part of the American dream. Uh, I had the pleasure of working for President Bush 41, of working in uh, Sophia in 1990 and 1991 to try to bring capitalism to Bulgaria after the wall fell. So I'm, I'm glad to see you're an American citizen and innovating uh, here in our country. Thank you. I think you've uh, done a good job talking about the, uh, uh, I'd say the acknowledged lesson that you've learned in terms of these uh, deposits uh, for clearing and the important risk management issue for your firm. 
So I'd like to uh, turn to uh, follow up on some of the discussions uh, about retail service uh, that you've also touched on today. Do you have a call center generally for Robinhood investors? Thank you for, for that question, Congressman. Um, and I, I want to start by saying customer service is fundamental to everything that we do. And it's one of the areas where we're investing the most. We have customer service centers in a number of states, Colorado, Florida, Texas, and Arizona. And we're looking to expand aggressively. Well, do you have a call center that I can call a 1-800 number if I'm having a trouble in the middle of the trading day? We, we do offer congressmen live phone support uh, in app for certain use cases. We're expanding that as fast as we can. Yeah, so as yeah. I mentioned earlier, options, yeah. advanced options cases, yeah. as well as account takeovers, uh, which typically happen through a customer's email, personal yeah. email who's been compromised. And the feedback's been great. And we're looking to expand the live phone channel, as well as make improvements to our email channel and Good. even Thank upstream you. within the product. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's helpful. And on the subject of uh, margin and options, you've talked about, about that today. But, uh, you know, in, uh, I've spent uh, 40 years in this business and been the general securities principal in three different firms. And this issue of granting margin and option approval to retail clients is always an important issue. You've addressed that today. So I want to turn to a different topic that has not been raised. And that's low dollar stocks. As I understand it, your policy and procedure manual simply said that you allow low dollar stocks if they're on an exchange, but many, many brokerage firms are very reticent to allow retail investors to invest in uh, stocks that are under $5. Could you address that issue today? Yes, I'd be happy to, Congressman. So Robinhood allows uh, customers to trade in and invest in exchange listed securities. So that's the objective criteria that we use. And it actually excludes several types of securities that customers commonly request to trade in. So on Robinhood, you can't trade over the counter bulletin boards, except in limited cases where a listed stock falls to over the counter. You can't trade pink sheets. And uh, of course you can't short sell or enter uh, undefined risk options trades. Okay. So our objective criteria involve whether exchanges list these securities. Thank you. And I think that probably, I'm sure you'll reevaluate that in the, after the, these effects. Let me turn to uh, Ms. Schulop. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, the Wall Street uh, Bets Reddit platform. I'm curious when you think about the obligation of this SEC pending investigation, based on your, based on your FINRA background, do you think the SEC should look at the bulletin board participants under Section uh, 9A2? on potentially inducing trading uh, in a certain direction? Is that worthy of their review? Thank you for the question, Congressman. I think that there's been little evidence to this time that there's been any sort of false or deceptive conduct taking place on the Wall Street's bets forum. That does not mean though, that I think that the SEC should not take a deeper look. Um, because of the anonymity in the forum, uh, there could have been people that were engaging in deceptive behavior um, that's not readily apparent to outside um, and to the public. So I do think the SEC should look, um, but but to this point, I've seen very little that would meet a test for manipulation, which generally involves false or deceptive behavior. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Tev, uh, I, I thought of another question for you. Would a, a securities transaction tax be beneficial to retail investors in the United States? Thank you, Congressman. I, I don't believe it would. Thank you. Um, Gentlemen's time has expired. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. You're back. Witnesses, we will take a short recess. The committee stands in recess for five minutes. Thank you.
Chair, you're recognized for five minutes. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Gill, let's start with you since uh, you seem to have started all of this. Um, you uh, began analyzing uh, GameStop in the summer of 2019. Is that was that your testimony? Uh, Congressman, I've been following GameStop for a number of years. I started to buy into it um, in June of 2019, most recently. Okay. So back then, what was the price of the stock when you started investing in it? At the time, it was in the ballpark of around $5 per share. Okay. And in your analysis, what did you think the proper price for the share was? Because you thought you were getting a good buy. Sure. At the time, I thought that the value of the business could be worth up to roughly $2 billion. Okay. But how much is that per share? Just let, uh, let's bring it back to the, you, you bought it five, you thought it was worth 10, 20? I felt as though that it could be worth at the time in the range of say 20 to $25 per share. Okay. And you continued to invest on and off through 2019 and 2020. Is that true? Yes. Okay. And you also, uh, you bought long, you bought some shares, but you also did some options trading. Did you not? Correct. I did. And options trading is not really for the novice investor, is it? It is, it is a riskier investment, yes. Okay. In, um, on January 27th, I think the stock price hit $483 or something like that. Is that true? I believe it was in that area, yes. In your analysis, back when you started investing in the stock, did you ever see it being valued at four? $183 per share? At the time, I thought there was a, it was possible, but a very low probability, I thought. Okay, thank you. Um, just a couple more questions. In terms of the platforms where you uh, visited and, and discussed this stock with others, um, one was the Reddit, subreddit, uh, uh, Wall Street Bets, platform, correct? Correct. And um, at, at any given time, how many people were you talking to on that platform? I wasn't so much talking to anyone individually, but rather making posts on that public forum. That GameStop was an attractive stock. Yeah, early on, I had felt um, that it was an attractive investment opportunity, and I had shared some of my thoughts as to why that was. Did you discuss this on any other platforms? Are there any other kinds of uh, Reddit or other kinds of platforms that you talked about the stock? Yes, I have talked about the stock on some other platforms. Okay. Um, did you ever talk about the short sellers uh, that had uh, bet against this company? Yes, the topic did come up. And about when did that occur? Oh, since around the time I had begun investing in it, it was, as uh, someone else has noted, it was an exceptional level of short interest in the stock since the time I had started investing in it. Okay. okay. Let me turn my attention now to you, Mr. Plotkin. Um, when did uh, uh, Melvin first take a short position in GameStop? Uh, thank you, Congressman. That was in uh, 2014, uh, really right at our inception of, of the fund. And when you did that, uh, did you, you continue to maintain a short position? Uh, that's correct. So you said you analyzed the value of the stock and you, by, by taking a short position, you, unlike Mr. Gill, thought that the stock was overpriced. He thought it was underpriced. You thought it was overpriced. Uh, that's, a, that's a good conclusion, yes. Okay. In your analysis, when you started into the short position, what did you think the stock was worth? Um, I don't remember exactly at the time. I think when we launched, it was probably a forty-dollar stock. I, I think we, you know, we believe the company had a lot of you know structural challenges. We've seen their earnings go from, I think, north of three dollars a share to almost negative three dollars a share. So. There's been a lot of challenges fundamentally. All right. Last question for you. Were you in a naked position on in your short position because the stock was oversold? 
No, our systems won't even allow that. So that would be impossible for us to do. Okay, well, thank you. My time's expired. I wanted to get some facts out for Mr. McHenry and I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman's time is Mr. Emmer. Thank you. Nice for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Ranking Member McHenry for holding this hearing. Thank you to the witnesses for being here today. Uh, I represent the first congressional district of New York, which encompasses much of Suffolk County on Long Island. My home district is full of people from all different walks of life and industries, and having access to cost-efficient investing is crucial. While there are always ways to make a system work better, our capital markets are the envy of the world with their liquidity and diversity of investment opportunities. Innovations in securities trading brought by the private sector have increased access for retail investors. Uh, for better or for worse, and this situation is a perfect example. Uh, for example, one of our witnesses here, Mr. G Mr. Gill, uh, or should I say Roaring Kitty, uh, turned $53,000 into almost $50 million, uh, and that's what you would call some deep you-know-what value. Of course, we know that not all those who invested in these stocks share the same success story. However, I want to highlight a potential vulnerability in these innovations. I've been concerned for some time in general with the sharing of U.S. individual user data with the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, I sent a letter, for example, to the Treasury Department in October 2019 expressing concern with the potential sharing of user information by TikTok to its parent company, ByteDance, and asked for a CFIUS review. Chinese companies are required by law to regulate online behavior that deviates from the political goals of the CCP, obey the CCP's censorship uh, directives, and participate in China's espionage. These policies regulate companies like TikTok in the China market and increasingly their overseas business. Webull and Moomoo are two examples of broker dealers that are subsidiaries of Chinese parent companies. According to Bloomberg, funds affiliated with Xiaomi Corp own at least 14% of Webull. Xiaomi is a Chinese company that risks being delisted from U.S. exchanges after the U.S. Department of Defense put the company on a blacklist on January 14, 2021. Moomoo is owned by Futu Holdings, which is a company that received a significant investment from entities affiliated with Tencent, a company with known ties to the CCP. On December 8, 2020, Bloomberg Businessweek ran an article on Webull stating the company, quote, has increased its roster of brokerage clients by about tenfold this year to more than two million by offering free stock trades with a slick online interface. On January 29, 2020, the day after trading activity for long trades on certain stocks discussed on Reddit threads were limited, Bloomberg ran an article with the headline, Robinhood rival Webull sees 16 fold jump in new trading accounts. It's clear that these apps have rapidly increased their user base, which has me concerned. Uh, Ms. Schulp, do you think we should be concerned about the potential for uh, Chinese entities with ties to the CCP receiving personally identifiable information or other user data from their subsidiary broker dealers that are licensed and registered in the US? I think it's a, a potential national security concern, which is a bit outside of my my area of expertise. What I can say is that the rules that the brokers have to apply and, and comply with regarding personally identifiable inf information and other material data um, should be applied equally to companies that are based offshore and companies that are based onshore. Um, and I, I hope that that's the case with respect to Webull or any other competitors that are not domestically owned. Having a, a diversity of choice for different trading apps is generally good for market competition. Uh, however, uh, is it good for is it a good outcome for millions of Americans to flood into trading apps that could be required to share user data to parent companies that have ties to the CCP? 
again, I think choice is, is key here, as well as understanding from a consumer perspective what you are, what companies you are choosing to do business with. Um, again, the national security concerns are, are a bit outside of my area of expertise. Well, I, I thank you for being here. Uh, this is uh, another angle to this issue with these new uh, options that are being provided to uh, average retail investors. And we also, we want these retail investors uh, to have the most amount of information as possible to be set up for success. I yield back. Thank you very much. Mr. Hines, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and a big thank you to our panel today for a very interesting conversation. Um, one of the uh, chairwoman's uh, uh, ways of characterizing this hearing was who wins and who loses. And I've spent a bunch of time in the last couple of days looking at uh, uh, at the various players here. I'm, I'm pretty convinced that the wholesalers, um, that uh, uh, Citadel uh, is one of the winners. They make a lot of money. Uh, they're the casino in this story, and the casino tends to, to win over time. Uh, Robinhood has a valuation of $5.6 billion and uh, makes a lot of money uh, from the casino. Um, so who loses? Uh, and I want to spend some time talking about the person who usually loses. Uh, and that's the retail investor. Um, and while I have supported for many years the democratization of finance, as we say, uh, it's not just in Washington, D.C., uh, but on Wall Street, the retail investor is known uh, as dumb money. Uh, and there are any number of structures that are set up to take advantage of the retail investor. Uh, and I think it's worth looking at that because as much as we're celebrating Mr. Gill here, we're not talking very much about Mr. Salvador Vergara, who was featured in a Wall Street Journal story, who took out a $20,000 personal loan uh, through Robinhood, invested it in GameStop, only to see this, the value of his position go down 80%. So Mr. Vergara is out $16,000 he doesn't have, that he owes to somebody else. Um, and as much as I support the democratization of finance, we need to be thoughtful about this. So Mr. Tenev, my question is for you. You quoted a $35 billion number as what I interpreted to be uh, profits in excess of deposited funds and securities. If you just look at your customers who traded in GameStop over the period of its increase and subsequent decrease, Mr. Tenev, how did your customers in the aggregate do? Did they win or did they lose? Thank you, Congressman, for that question. I, I don't have that particular cut of the data top of mind, so maybe we can get back to you on that one. All right, you don't have that. So you do have a $35 billion figure. The figure doesn't mean a lot to me because it's just a dollar number. Help me convert that to a, a rate of return. Uh, first of all, is that $35 billion, is that gross or net? In other words, is that actual profit or does it include margin shares, other forms of leverage that may actually not belong to the account holder? It, it does include, Congressman, unrealized gains. So um, it's uh, the value of assets, both including uh, positions in uh, securities and cryptocurrencies. Uh, okay, I, I, I get that. I, I, I get that. But again, $35 billion doesn't mean anything to me unless you can convert that into a rate of return. So do that for me. What is that? Uh, on, on what asset under management number is that $35 billion unrealized against? The, the asset under management number is not one that Robinhood has publicly shared. Um, okay, but you can't share $35 billion. billion. Sorry, Mr. Tenev, I just don't have a lot of time. $35 billion is a meaningless number. I need to know what that is in terms of return. So convert that for me into rate of return. So I can compare it to Treasury, so I can compare it to the S&P 500. Con Congressman, with respect, I think the proper comparison is uh, to customers not investing at all. Much of our customers are investing for the first time and are taking money that they otherwise would have spent or consumed and putting Mr. it in Mr. Tenev, market. again, I don't, I don't want to be rude, but, but it's, it's my time. Again, you, you offered up the $35 billion number, which as you and anybody else schooled in finance knows is meaningless unless you convert it into a rate of return. So just please convert that $35 billion number, which to the folks rising at home, uh, watching at home sounds like a lot of money, but what does that actually convert to in, a, in terms of rate of return, which is what matters? Congressman, uh, $35 billion is 
indeed a large amount of, of money, especially for our customers who are mostly small investors. It's more than most corporations, nearly Mr. all corporations Tenef, have paid Mr. It. Tenef, again, I don't, I don't, don't make me be rude here. You and I both know that $35 billion of unrealized gains, if that's on a base of $100 billion, that's a 35% of return. If that's on, on under a trillion dollars, it's a radically different rate of return. So what, I, what I'm trying to get at, Mr. Tenev here, is you threw out the number of $35 billion. I actually think the right comparison is, what if your clients had simply invested in the long run in an S&P index fund? Would, they have, would that number be more than $35 billion or less? Congressman, with respect, I don't believe the right comparison is investing in an S&P index fund. I think uh, the right comparison is not having invested at all and having instead spent that money and consumed it. No, no, it's it's most certainly not. Uh, it's most certainly not, Mr. Tenet. And so I'm going to ask you, I'm out of time. But again, you put out the $35 billion number. So I think it's only decent because you and I both know that a hard dollar number is meaningless unless you can convert it to return. So I'm going to ask you to convert that. Uh, obviously, I'm out of time into a rate of return for us. You're out of time. Mr. Laudermilk, you now recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate uh, all the members of the panel being here. I think you've uh, seen that uh, there are occasions with uh, some on the the uh, the the, the committee here that if they're not, if you're not giving them the answer that they want, that they can use, they're just going to continue to push on you. And uh, so uh, just, con I just encourage you to continue uh, uh, speaking the truth and you'll always stand up head and shoulders uh, above everyone. Um, not surprisingly, the situation with GameStop trading has resulted in commentators and even some of my colleagues uh, engaging in knee-jerk reactions, calling for new laws and regulations to be hastily enacted. It just seems to be a trend in Washington, D.C. to never let a crisis go to waste. Some have even spread conspiracy theories and alleged that crimes were committed before knowing what even happened. I can even testify uh, to, to what was just being said is I know numbers of people, uh, personal friends who have never invested before, but because of Robin Hood and other uh, retail platforms, many of them took the stimulus money that they received during the CARES Act, which they were still working, they didn't need, and they actually started an account and started investing. So yes, more and more people who have never invested before are now investing using these platforms. Um, this hearing is a reminder that with complex situations, uh, we should take time to understand what actually did or did not happen, especially with this GameStop situation. Now, the SEC is the proper authority to determine if any rules were broken, and they are looking into it. Congress has already given the SEC broad authority to oversee the capital markets, and we do not need to rush to enact even more big government regulations until we ultimate, that, that could ultimately harm the investors. Now, question, Mr. Tenet, can you remind us, again, why Robinhood temporarily uh, paused trading of GameStop, GameStop and other stocks? Of course, thank you, Congressman. Uh, Robinhood paused trading temporarily, or I should say paused buying of uh, about 13 securities on Thursday so that we could meet our regulatory deposit and collateral requirements. Okay, so what you're saying is you were paused because you had to comply with regulations. Is that true? Correct. All right. So it's ironic that the people who are criticizing brokerage firms because they pause trading, which they sometimes have to do to comply with regulations, these same folks are now saying we need to re respond to this with more regulations. I, I would say if people don't like brokers occasionally having to pause trading, I'd suggest they look at the regulations that required it. At some point, we need to recognize that piling on more and more regulations only increases complexity and does not help investors. A uh, question for uh, Ms. Schultz. Despite the volatility and the frenzy of media and social media activity, it seems to me like the markets functioned as they were supposed to during this situation and that markets are not broken. In fact, they are working well. Do you agree with that? I agree with that. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. I think. I think most reasonable people that are listening to this would agree that there are regulations in place. The SEC has those to pause uh, activities that could be harmful. 
not only to the markets, but to the individual investors. And so what I'm understanding you saying is that it did work in the way it was supposed to. As, as the facts that I know now, um, it does appear to have worked the way it was supposed to. This is not a sign to me that the market is broken. Thank you. Mr. Griffin, what are some of the issues that policymakers should consider in the T plus two, T plus one, T plus zero debate? I, obviously margin requirements exist to make sure firms have enough capital to settle transactions, but faster settlement and lower margin requirements can be positive for the retail investors and we need to balance those needs. Can you uh, address what some of the issues are in the, in the T2, T1 and T0 debate? So, Congressman, I cannot profess to be an expert on these issues, but I will give you my perspectives from having been in the industry for 30 years. We started at T5. We will one day be at real time settlement. And the question is, is how long does that journey take from T2 to T1, which reduces the amount of capital required by broker dealers to meet the needs of their customers? That reduction in capital will be meaningful, would have been very helpful to Robinhood during this period of time. Reduces counterparty risk holistically, which is good for everybody in the market. We should push for T1. As we go to same day settlement, you now bring into question the complexity of intraday cash movement, and you bring into play the necessity for all systems to be functioning every moment of every day with no room for error. On a T1 settlement cycle. Uh, let me remind the members that uh, we're going to have a series of hearings. Today is the first. There will be probably two more. I didn't hear anyone here today say uh, that they were ready to pile on regulations. So let's make sure we know that our statements are accurate. Uh, Mr. Foster, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and to our witnesses. Um, Mr. Tenov, I'd like to follow up a little bit on payment for order flow and, and best order execution issues. Uh, democratization of finance is a good and noble goal, but for democracy to work, uh, consumers need transparency and high quality information, and not only about fees, but about order execution quality. Your customers actually don't care directly about um, who you subcontract order execution to or or any payment for order flow, but they need a simple way to compare the execution quality between your app and competing apps or other accounts. And you know, while institutional investors can afford to run their own tests, and, and they do, and I'm sure uh, Mr. Griffin is normally, um, is quite often on the receiving end of those tests and trying to measure up to his competitors uh, to compete for market share there. Um, they, the institutional investors have the market power to demand best execution statistics for their prime brokers. And everyday investors do not uh, get the same transparency. In fact, I believe there's an SEC rule, rule 606, that requires brokers to disclose at least some order execution data to institutional investors. But this requirement does not apply to retail investors. Uh, so, Mr. Tenna, since Robinhood's mission is to democratize democratize finance for all. I ask, um, what are the mechanisms that you would accept and support to provide transparent order execution quality statistics so that your customers can engage in a clean apple and app, apples to apples comparison between um, you know, other brokers, between your app and other people's apps in terms of the total cost of trading? Thank you, Congressman, for that very important question. I'm generally in favor of a greater amount of transparency than what we've typically seen in the financial industry. And recently, Robinhood and, and me personally have engaged publicly on the topic of payment for order flow, short selling, and of course, T plus two and, and real time settlement. We do publish uh, 606s via Robinhood Securities that detail our payment for order flow arrangements with various market makers. and. Just this past year, the industry implemented um, more detailed 606 requirements, which we, of course, conform to. Also, back in December of 2020, uh, we released uh, a public page on our website that provided detail about the execution quality, including price improvement that our customers received. And we're proud to announce in 2020 our customers received in aggregate over a billion dollars of price improvement on their executions. 
Right, but that that's not a comparison to your competitors. You know, there are a lot of questions about the accuracy of the the best execution uh, pri reference price, and independent of whether it should be improved, um, it seems like if I was a customer of you or one of your competitors, what I'd want to see is, you know, I just executed a trade of two thousand dollars, and on average, I got X percent better or worse than a reference price. Um, and then over time and see not only the, the trade that I just executed, but perhaps a, an av a running average over the last month or two that you can compare to the running average of whether you're exceeding some, some benchmark for, for trade execution quality that can really be compared with potential competitors. Um, and is that is that a workable system? Are there difficulties? Is there a reason why industry should not move that way um, in the name of, of transparency to customers? Congressman, this is a very interesting topic to me. Uh, I'd love to have the conversation. I, I don't know if this is the right forum to necessarily ideate and brainstorm on all the solutions, but I just want to say I'd be happy to engage with this in a detailed forum and uh, and figure out the right path. Okay, well, yeah, we do intend to continue to engage with um, with the industry on this subject because it's you know it's very easy to make payment for order flow sound really creepy. You know, you're basically selling a list of rubes to the sharks. Okay. On the other hand, you make part of an argument that this can net out positive for consumers, but for it to fully net out positive, they have to be able to make the apples to apples comparison. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, I think really, really an important issue. And I think that probably your reaction to that, if you found your customers were leaving you because of poor execution quality, you would do what large funds do, which is to split your order flow between multiple uh, order execution firms and then demand of them the best order, the best order execution and move your, your business to whoever does the best for your customers. Yes, well, Congressman, we already do that. We have seven. Mr. Mooney, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. So let me just start by saying the last Congress, 30 of my Democrat colleagues, four of whom on this very committee, uh, co-sponsored a bill that would impose a financial transaction tax on the purchase of securities and certain derivatives. And just recently after the market volatility surrounding GameStop in January, uh, Democrats renewed the call many Democrats anyway, renewed the call for a financial transaction tax. On just January 28th, Congresswoman Ileana Omar tweeted, how about this, financial transaction tax now. Congressman Peter DeFazio is the lead sponsor of the bill. Uh, he's already put the bill back in for this, this, uh, this uh, session of Congress. It's now House Resolution 328 uh, of 2000. And, uh, so it's called the Financial, the Wall Street Tax Act Wall Street Tax Act of 2021. I actually have a copy of it from the last session here. It's in again now. And he says, uh, Congressman DeFazio uh, says that a financial transaction tax would, quote, help create a more level playing field for Main Street. So with that background, uh, Mr. Tenev, this question is directed at you. Uh, the Robinhood platform has more than 13 million users, and most of them are small dollar retail investors. If the federal government levied a 0.1% transaction tax on the sale of securities, how, and I know one of my colleagues, French Hill, my good friend mentioned this earlier, but I want you, you know, I want to expand upon a little more. How would that 0.1% transaction tax on the sale of securities affect your platform and the retail investors that are your customers? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, and We'd be happy to, to engage in this, uh, in this discussion much more in the future. Um, a 10 basis point financial transaction tax would eat into the returns of our customers, which as you pointed out, are largely uh, smaller investors. Uh, and in that sense, it would be a cost to the retail investor. Um, of course, that would have to be weighed against the potential benefits of this tax. And I know it's a more complicated issue um, than meets the eye at first glance. Okay, <clears throat> well, thank you for that answer. Uh, my next question is actually for Jennifer Schlupp. I know you spent your career specializing in financial regulation. In your expert opinion, 
would a financial transaction tax directly prevent fraud or market manipulation? No, I don't think a financial transaction tax would would have an effect on fraud or manipulation. Um, I also don't think that it ultimately financial transaction taxes often fail to raise money and they they distort trading in a way that's not necessarily foreseen initially by the tax. Um, and I, I'd like to just add in there as well that that financial transaction taxes, while they initially might seem like a small imposition on an individual investor, um, those taxes often hurt individual investors and in their their long term retirement goals by by um, affecting the institutions that also do the trading in mutual funds and with retirement money. Um, I don't think a financial tax and t transaction tax is a good idea. And a quick follow up to that, Mr. Slough, what do you think a financial transaction tax would have done anything to prevent the market volatility and disruption we saw just this past January? No, I don't. I don't think it's related here. Um, there's been some discussion that it that it might have decreased the amount of trading um, and thus changed the volatility. It's not my opinion that that would have had any effect on this particular circumstance. Thank you. I only have a minute left, so let me just summarize. The financial transaction tax supported by many Democrats would do nothing to prevent market manipulation or fraud, would have not prevented the market disruption in January, and most importantly, would hurt retail investors. Yet Democrats are claiming that the events surrounding GameStop and Robinhood in January make it imperative uh, to implement this financial transaction tax. It just doesn't add up. A financial transaction tax would make it more expensive for small retail investors to trade. And so much for looking out for Main Street. I believe we should be working together to find ways to open up markets to retail investors, not close them. Instead of making trade more expensive with a burdensome tax, let's look for ways to empower retail traders. Thank you, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you very much. Ms. Beatty, you're recognized for five minutes. Ms. Beatty. Thank you, I'm Madam uh, Chairperson, and thank you to the witnesses. Uh, my first question is to uh, the CEO, President Ken Griffin. In, in the first three quarters of 2020, your company paid online brokerages like Robinhood $700 million for their order flow. Do you believe that brokers like Robinhood can serve as the, the best interest of their users while selling their order flow to companies like yours? And that's yes or no. Congressman, I believe that Robinhood actually goes further in meeting the best interest of their customers by in fact routing their order flow to Citadel. We give a better price, a better execution for American retail investors than the alternative of going to exchanges. So I'm going to take that as a, a yes, since you said they they go further. Then can you tell me why did your company urge the SEC to ban the payment for order flow models in a, a filing to the SEC? Congressman, that is a terrific question. That filing relates to the U.S. options market. It was a filing back, I believe, in 2004. And in the U.S. options market at the time, trades were committed against listed quotes. We were apprehensive about the direction in which the U.S. options market was heading towards the existence of these price improvement auctions, which diminished the incentives to aggressively provide bids and offers in the options market. We felt that legislative or regulatory efforts to encourage tight quoting, to discourage the existence of these auctions, and this was being, in some sense, fueled by a series of payment for order flow programs, was in the best interest of American institutional and retail investors. Now, regretfully, we did not prevail in our reasoning. The rise of price improvement auctions came into, in essence, the day-to-day -day model for options trading in the United States. And I do believe that this is a setback for our capital markets. So because my clock is ticking, let me ask you this. So are you saying that you no longer believe that the motto is anti-competitive and distorts order routing decisions? 
I think it's important to distinguish between a market where you must trade on an exchange. In the options market, we must print the trade on an exchange versus a market where you can trade off exchange, which would be the US equities market. So just to be very clear, because your question is very good, every single options trade must be executed on an exchange. Equity trades do not. And because of that, I can save Robinhood exchange fees and offer a tighter bid ass spread. Okay, than the clearly we're going to have to have a further discussion. Let, let me interrupt you only because my time is clicking and, and I want to follow up uh, with a question for Robin Hood's uh, CEO. Uh, several of the brokers uh, offer their users order flow for the sale to the firm, like with um, the previous uh, CEO with Citadel. However, the price that Robinhood gets for the order flow is much higher than any other brokers um, any other brokers receives. And I could go on and tell you we've pulled the SEC filings that Robinhood receives 17 percent uh, per 100 share stock of um, traded uh, and 58 percent to 100 shares. And I could go on, but the question is. Uh, why do companies like Citadel pay a premium for their order flows of Robinhood users? Thank, thank you, Congresswoman, for that very important question. Uh, there's several reasons that may be the case. One important one is that our model uh, and formula for payment for order flow works a little bit differently. We actually receive payment for order flow as a percentage of the bid ask spread rather than on a per share basis. And we do believe that that's the most optimal way to structure payment for order flow arrangements. Uh, okay, it, it's not be, it, is it not because companies uh, like Citadel can make more money off of Robinhood users than others? And that's a yes or no, because my clock is gonna run out. Uh, no. I'm sorry, I, I yield back. My time is up. Thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, we will have Mr. Vargas. Uh, excuse me, no, Mr. Davidson next and then Mr. Vargas. Mr. Davidson, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I thank our witnesses. I appreciate the uh, work you've done today. And um, I just wanna share that in May of 2020, the Depository Trust Clearing Corporation unveiled a working proof of concept called Project Ion. In this project, DTC, DTCC said they would examine the potential use of distributed ledger technology in accelerating the clearing and settlement process. Now, since Project Ion was publicly announced, we've received little information pertaining to its progress. As a longtime advocate for this emerging technology, uh, distributed ledger technology and blockchain, uh, today, I've sent a letter to the DTCC re to request that they provide an update on the status of Project ION, and I look forward to hearing back from them, hope to include them in our next hearing. Mr. Griffin, with Project ION in mind, could you briefly state uh, what would be your biggest concern if DTCC uh, implements same-day clearing and settlement? Same day clearing and settlement requires that every bit of the workflow is perfectly synchronized across all parties and we have no time for recoverability or for air management that you have in an overnight batch process. Right, so the, the technology makes that essential uh, in my assessment and many that, that is inherent to the architecture for blockchain uh, to, to move forward with each, each uh, uh, proof. Uh, and so uh, I guess clearly in your business, just to follow up there, the technology exists where, you know, for trading firms that are engaged in high frequency trading, you measure success in the course of the day in, in what, milliseconds uh, for, for high frequency trading? So, as you know, we are the largest market maker in the world and the largest in the United States in equities we put great emphasis on the performance of our systems. That was one of the reasons that on the week of January 24th, we were the only major market center for retail order flow. 
that was responsive every minute of every trading day. We Perfect. So I just wanted to make the point that I think the technology exists, whether you use blockchain or not, and uh, you know, applaud you for having the ability to execute yeah, with precision swiftly uh, already. And, and I don't think it's a barrier. And I, I'd love to have more dialogue, but unfortunately I have to go to, to a few others. Uh, you know, Mr. Tenev, uh, do you believe that the root cause of uh, January 28th for um, the problems that you and others experienced were market infrastructure related, particularly related to T2 versus T0? I believe, uh, thank you, Congressman. I do believe if we had real-time settlement capability and the infrastructure was modernized, we would not have uh, seen similar problems. Yeah, and, and thanks for that. I think, you know, one of the related things, and it's related to your mission, hood, mission at Robinhood of more democratic access to capital, is not just the ability for more people in a broader portion of America to become savers and investors. Um, it, it's also uh, to engage in, in corporate governance even. So uh, do you believe that, that, that if um, market infrastructure would guarantee this is really related to, you know, the over, um, you know, musical shares where someone could be left with no share when the music stops, multiple claims on a shorted stock. If the market infrastructure would guarantee an investor could retain custody of their shares so that the shares can't be lent to short sellers, there could be a downside. How do you feel that only one claim on the shares would resolve this? And that relates to proxy voting as well, or shareholders voting the shares. Congressman, uh, I, I believe that that's an important question. It's one that Robinhood and me personally have engaged with. Um, I do believe that the ability for the same share to be shorted an indefinite number of times is somewhat of a pathology and that should be fixed. And I think step one of that is modernizing the antiquated settlement infrastructure that everything is built on. We simply don't have the ability to properly track what shares have been shorted and how many times as they're moving through our settlement system currently. Yeah, thank you for that. And I get, I appreciate that you see the relationship. Hopefully broadly we do and we provide that uh, nudge the market needs. I wanna commend Vice Chancellor Travis Laster of the Delaware Chancellery Court uh, for his letter and paper, The Blockchain Plunger, which explains how this could be done. And I ask unanimous consent to submit that to the record. Uh, as my time it expires, I want to uh, commend you, Mr. Gill, for just representing a large segment of the industry, in my view, where savvy investors have had an opportunity to engage. And it relates to people with diamond hands that hold. So you might not call yourself a holder, you might use the word diamond hands, but thanks and congratulations for your success. The gentleman's time has expired, and without objection, your submission uh, is uh, taken. Thank you. Mr. Vargas? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. First of all, I want to apologize to Mr. Plotkin. Uh, you spoke of the anti-Semitic attacks that you suffered um, online. And as a person of color, I always feel the need to confront hate speech and speak out. Uh, and I don't think there's ever been a more hateful, evil, sinful event in human history than the Holocaust. So I want to apologize uh, to you and your family for those attacks. Uh, you brought it up, and I, I think we. Uh, owe you an apology. I want to apologize for that. Um, sometimes I think some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are devoid of any contact with real people when they say this is just political theater or they don't want to know the rate of return when that's exactly what people want to know. In fact, uh, there's been a great deal of interest in this hearing. And I think it's because there's this great distrust in our society and in government, markets, institutions. And then along comes the story of GameStop. And, and it's a story really of Robin Hood turned on its head. And the reason I say that is Mr. Zuckermeyer uh, brought it up. Uh, Robin Hood is a English folk hero, uh, 13th, 14th century. And he was supposed to steal, Robin of Lockley was supposed to steal from the rich and give to the poor. And here you almost have the opposite. You have the situation where you have the steal from the small retail investor and giving it the large institutional investor. Um, from an outsider's perspective, you have the bullies, the hedge funds, and their armies of analysts and lawyers and regular old suits attacking the trust aim stop by shorting its stock. And then to the rescue, 
here comes the retail investors and they're taking stock to these incredible levels and all of a sudden robin hood steps in but not to help the little guy he he steps in and says i'm gonna help the big guy and stops the sale because no one knows how high this is going to go and who's getting it who's getting socked in this thing the bullies are the hedge funds and that's why people were excited about this but all of a sudden robin hood steps in and they say no no you know we had to do this because of other conditions and my good friends the republicans say it was government really it was you know because the government regulations forced them to do this well that's not what the public thinks the public thinks that there was collusion that the big guys all of you guys were figuring out how to do this and ultimately come out ahead as you always do um and it, it seems my colleagues on the other side want to help people now mr griffin if i could just ask you the first question how many people are in the room with you you could just count how many people are in the room with you. There are five people, including myself in this room, sir, Congressman. Thank you. So I don't think my colleagues need to help the CEOs or anybody else. They got plenty of help. Now, I have to ask this. Uh, you said that you didn't talk to anybody of Citadel, Citadel Securities. Did anyone in your organization since January 1st contact Robinhood? Are you asking if we've had contact with Robin? With Hood? respect to with respect with respect to GameStop and and what we're obviously talking about. So, Congressman, we offered to have my colleague who manages that relationship be here today. Instead, he has firsthand knowledge. We, of course, are talking to Robin Hood routinely in the ordinary course of business. We manage a substantial portion of their order flow. Well, I understand that, but did you talk to them about restricting or doing anything to prevent people from buying, not selling, but buying in GameStop? Let me be- Anybody in your organization? Let me be perfectly clear. Absolutely not. So if we depose everyone in your organization, we will find that. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Um, I do want to ask you one thing, and Mr. Uh, Mr. Sherman was pursuing this. How do you balance the best execution for the order flow from your purchase from Robinhood with the need to profit from the purchased order flow? How do you do that? So as a market maker, we have to provide to the customer a better price than they can achieve on exchange. Order flow is routed to us on the merits of the execution quality that we provide in contrast to our competitors who we are competing with. Okay, my, my time's about to expire, but I have to say when, Mr. Tenev, when you say that you guys made $35 billion and you don't say how much your, your people lost on home stops, people that invested in you, that's like taking the fifth. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Budd? Thank you, Chair. Mr. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes. Thank you. And uh, I want to also thank the panel. Now, I really care about a level playing field for retail investors to uh, access the market. And I've been a long supporter of financial innovation and fintech and the shared goal of democratizing finance and making access to the financial system easier for all. So, Mr. Tenev, your company, it boasts that it's helping to democratize finance and is at the forefront of innovation. Can you talk a little more about what Robinhood is doing to push innovation forward and create a level playing field for all investors while at the same time making sure that those investors are well informed? Absolutely, Congressman. Thank you for that very important question. Uh, the first thing I should note is many of the witnesses and um, and representatives here have stated that it's never been a better time to be a retail investor in America than it is right now. I think the combination of zero commissions, no account minimums, fractional shares, uh, really things that Robinhood has helped make the industry standard uh, have helped small investors and um, and helped level the, blame, the playing field for, for people to participate in the markets. Over the past year, Robinhood has released fractional shares 
the ability to do dividend automated dividend reinvestments, recurring investments, so that you could take one dollar or five dollars and create a habitual investment into a particular stock. Um, and the theme of this year for Robinhood is how do we take a first time investor and turn them into a long term habitual investor? Um, how do we make long term investing accessible, uh, accessible for, for people around the country? And we're making huge investments in education and customer support to support that. Uh, we recently re released a revamped learn portal. We call it learn 2.0 with the aim mm -hmm. of taking a customer from basic concepts such as what is a share, what is a stock, what's an ETF, all the way through to more advanced concepts. And we're continuing to invest more and more on Learn as well as um, on Snacks, which is our, our popular podcast uh, and all other forms of content that we distribute. Last year, more than 3.2 million. I want, to, I want to interrupt you there. Just, I know you have a lot more things. These are, these are great. I know we could probably talk for a lot longer than this, but. I want to shift gears just a bit, but I do want to keep talking about the retail investor, and I want to switch to uh, Ms. Schulp. So back in December, there's an article that you wrote um, prior to all these events that we're even having the hearing on today. And in the article, I think that you were, you said that it's inappropriate to refer to these very retail investors that we're talking about that are using these platforms like Robinhood that we're talking about and referring to those investors as dumb money. I think that's pretty insulting. And my colleague from across the aisle from Connecticut used that term. I think it's insulting. And instead, retail investors are in fact revolutionizing the stock market. So would you elaborate on those views, uh, Ms. Schultz? Absolutely. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, retail investors are often referred to as dumb money by Wall Street. And it's because they don't have access to the same level of research or some use the term because they think retail investors make dumb decisions. Um, I think it's insulting. I think that the term needs to go out the window. Uh, retail investors are investors who make their decisions based on the information known to them. And we should focus on educating people so that they can understand the risks and rewards of investing. Uh, here, I think the GameStop uh, situation is proof that the retail investors are revolutionizing the market. Uh, no one would have guessed when I wrote that article in December that retail investors were going to initiate a sophisticated short squeeze. Uh, I think the retail investors here are learning, uh, learning by doing, which is one of the best ways to learn. And we should spend effort making sure that people are equipped with the knowledge to understand the risks about being in the market. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, I would like to ask for unanimous consent to insert that letter into the record, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I just want to look, uh, you know, Robin Hood wrote about the need for, and this is open to anyone, and uh, I've just got a few seconds left, but I'd like for someone to talk about, is it possible for clearing houses and real-time settlements on the blockchain to exist? Um, I don't have time for that, but that's something we can come back to at a further point. And Madam Chair, I just, I'll go ahead and yield back. Uh, thank you very much. And without objection, I want to make sure that that's in the record that uh, your uh, insertion uh, was accepted. Thank you. Uh, with that, you. I'm going to turn to Mr. Gottheimer. Mr. Gottheimer, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you to our witnesses for being here today. Before I begin, Mr. Gill, I read your testimony, and I'd like to offer my heartfelt condolences for the loss your family suffered last year. Uh, it's not just Melvin Capital that lost money as part of the frenzy around GameStop. Whether it is a, secure, a security guard losing $20,000 or a dog walker losing a few hundred dollars, everyday retail investors were left holding the bag after GameStop stock fell back to earth. Not every investor lost money, and Mr. Gale sitting before us here today remains bullish on the stock. Still, Bloomberg reported yesterday that he was served a lawsuit accusing him of misrepresenting himself and his motivations. I'm not here today to take sides in the litigation. However, it does raise important questions about the role of social media websites like Reddit, especially in the context of volatility, we experienced with GameStop, AMC, and, uh, and numerous other stocks last month. Uh, Mr. Huffman, what kind of authentication exists for Reddit users to confirm their identities, to verify that are even real people? Reddit, and it, this is an important quality of Reddit, so thank you for the question, doesn't require people to reveal their 
full identity to use the platform. One of our pillars of privacy, and privacy is something that's critically important to us, is that users should be masters of, the, of their own identity, and they can choose to reveal as little or as much as they would like. I'll point out that um, there are two sides of this that are really important. On one side, this allows Reddit to work. Something like Wall, Street's, Wall Street bets would not exist if users had to reveal their full identity, because in Wall Street bets, people are revealing gains and losses. They're effectively re revealing their financial position in life, and we would not put that burden on anybody to force them to do so. Well, there is a point out that other that... platforms have real identity, and it doesn't do anything to improve their behavior. Can I just ask a question of that? Is there, is there any way for a regular user of Wall Street bets subreddit to know what content is genuine written by other, other users just like themselves? Retail investors who are looking for honest information to invest on, is there any way for that? So there are a couple aspects to this. So the first is that we as a company invest significant resources in enforcing the veracity of our voting system. It's something we've been doing for 15 years, um, long uh, before events like this, long before even the election and the politics of the last few years, um, where these things have become top of mind for everybody. This has been critically important to us. Also, our user base is exceptionally good at sniffing out untruths, misinformation, fake stories, both within this community and Reddit at large. And so in order for any piece of content to be successful on Reddit, it has to be accepted by that community and receive the same votes that anything else would. Uh, do you have any heightened standards for places like Wall Street Bets or other investing subreddits where moderators are able to manipulate content to their own financial gains? We keep a high standard across the entire site. Um, and in this particular, with this particular community over the past few weeks, we've been looking especially closely, anticipating you know, these sorts of issues and questions. And to date, we have not found any nefarious behavior. Got it, but we could have a situation where thousands, possibly millions of dollars of retail investor money may be being manipulated, right? We, we don't know that. People sure. in the United States talk about stocks on Reddit. They talk about it on TV, in magazines. People can say, um, they can, in fact, they do on television all the time, encourage people to make what I would call bad investment decisions. On Reddit, I think the investment advice is actually probably among the best because it has to be accepted by many thousands of people before getting that sort of visibility. Do you see any difference between someone on Reddit uh, offering advice versus an analyst at a, at a major bank or a financial services firm? Absolutely. I think on Reddit, you're seeing retail investors who are giving authentic advice based on their knowledge. And you would not, pull, I think, call into question what their motivations are or what large positions they may hold before going on TV and talking about them. Do you plan to do more in this space? And are you, is this something that's going to be a major priority of yours? And do you, and do you think overall um, uh, social media companies like yourselves should be held to a different standard? Should, be, should you be responsible? for what happens in your content is it should you know if someone manipulates something or if it's a bot should that be on you or do you think that's just uh, buyer beware we take uh, manipulation of reddit ex incredibly seriously um, that is one of our uh, i think uh, first duties on all of this is to ensure the authenticity of our communities yes got it but do you think you should be held responsible if somebody puts something if, if there's some collusion or if there's as somebody who is a, it's a rush, it's a bot that's online. Do you think you should be on the line or this is just a site you offer for people to exchange ideas? Um, Reddit can be held responsible. Um, and we do take our responsibilities here incredibly seriously. Thank you. The much time to have Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Kostoff, you're Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I want to thank you and the ranking member for convening today's hearing. If I could, Mr. Mr. Tenev, I, I'd like to echo what many of my colleagues have said today. And we do appreciate the fact that you've created this platform to a large extent, you've, you've leveled the playing field so that uh, small individual investors can, can have a shot at the American dream. That's, that's investing. Uh, now, I do wanna ask you though, and, and a lot's been said about, uh, about the situation that occurred uh, in late January. My, my question to you is, how did you misjudge your capital requirements to prevent people from, from being able to trade during that period in January? Thank you, uh, Congressman. Uh, 
I wouldn't say we misjudged our capital requirements. This was a one in 3.5 million occurrence event, one that had never been seen before in capital markets. And uh, we had to play this by the book. Robinhood Securities made the decision that we did so that we could remain in compliance with our regulatory capital and deposit requirements. Unfortunately, it required us to restrict the buying of these securities uh, for Thursday and uh, limit it to some degree on subsequent days until additional capital came in that allowed us to relax the restrictions. Uh, it was Robin Hood's mistake, though, correct? Well, Robin Hood owns what happened, certainly, and we need to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Uh, but Robin Hood really, Robin Hood Securities uh, had limited options with how to how to address this and. Uh, I fully support the team in making the decision that they did, and I believe they did the right thing and the only thing. I, I realize you, you said at the beginning that, that you're privately held. With, with that said, is your primary source of revenue from the order flow payments that you received from, uh, from some of the players that we talked about today? That, that is correct, Congressman. Payment for order flow is one of our largest revenue sources. Is it the largest? It's the largest, yes. Now, in your in your testimony, in your written testimony, oral testimony, you talked about the the settlement period and, and what we're probably capable of doing in, in real time, or instead of T plus two, maybe the T plus one. If if we had real time settlement, would the situation that have occurred that, that did occur in, in January? Would that have been preventable? In other words, that wouldn't have happened if we had real-time settlement? Congressman, um, if, if we were to have real-time settlement, and of course there's some implementation details that would govern this, there would be less of a need for collateral at clearing houses because the cash and securities transactions would be exchanged in real time. So collateral for uh, counterparty risk would be less necessary. So real-time settlement would lead to reduction, perhaps an elimination in some of these collateral requirements, um, a reduction in the money that's sort of clogging up the, the plumbing of the system, and uh, that would have avoided some of these problems altogether. Thank, thank you very much. It, it, just, just to be clear, does the same answer apply if I asked you if settlement was T plus one instead of same day settlement? Would your answer be the same? Congressman, T, T plus one certainly would be would be better, um, but it doesn't. It, it reduces the scope of the problem. It it doesn't eliminate it from a technology standpoint. Thank you very much, Mr. Huffman. If I could, I'd like to follow up on some of the questioning that my colleagues, Congressman Hill and Congressman Gottenheimer, asked. You've done an investigation into uh, into Reddit, into, into Wall Street bets. Uh, you don't see any any bad actors. I'm paraphrasing, but you don't see any bad actors uh, that uh, that caused any role in the in the GameStop frenzy. Am I characterizing that correctly, Congressman? That's right. Uh, you know the Congress is looking at amending Section 230. What are your thoughts about that as it relates to Reddit? Sure. So Section 230, I think, is a critically important law to the Internet as we know it. And it was created, in fact, to protect a forum in the early Internet for talking about stocks. Um, Section 230, I think it's also important to point out, doesn't protect platforms or companies like ours from civil litigation. Um, so there are mechanisms for coming after companies like ours. What it does protect is our ability to evolve the way we moderate our content. And in which we have done in many ways um, over the last decade. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Gonzalez, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker and Ranking Member. And I want to thank everyone in the committee here with us today. Uh, Mr. This is uh, for Cytadel. Mr. Griffin, in 2020, Cytadel violated regulation uh, SHO, which governs short selling. Cytadel is now involved in another short selling problem and Robinhood routes half of its customers' orders to you. Robinhood halts buying on a position that you're, that you, that you're long on and, and you own the hedge fund and the, and the clearing broker. 
What is there to prevent you from taking advantage of that situation and making sure you profit off the confusion and retail investors? Congressman, I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to understand the question. Let me let me give it to you again. In um, in 2020, Citadel violated regulation SHO, which governs short selling. Citadel is now involved in another short selling problem, and Robinhood routes half of its customers to, to you. It orders to you. Robinhood halts buying on a position that you're long on and you own the hedge fund and the clearing broker, what is there to prevent you from taking advantage of that situation and making sure you profit off the confusion of retail investors? So in, in no particular order, I, I just do not understand the reference to us owning a clearing broker. We do not own DTCC. We do not control DTCC. We are not we are not party to the discussion, dialogue, or demands between DTCC and Robinhood. So I, I, I do not understand the premise of the question because we have literally nothing to do with DTCC other than being a member of DTCC for providing settlement services for us and for doing real-time trade affirmation and clearing. Now, Citadel Securities owes a duty of best execution for every order that comes from Robinhood. And I will tell you that I'm incredibly proud of how seriously my team takes that duty of best execution. Some of the most earnest, hardworking, and thoughtful people that I've ever met in my life work on our retail execution business here at Citadel and take great pride in the execution quality that we give to each and every trader, not only at Robinhood, but at every single one of the Thank retail. You. Thank you for your response, Mr. Gill. But I understand that you made your position known on Gates, GameStop as far back as 2019 and are lauded as a diamond hands hero by Wall Street bets. Uh, community, have you ever previously experienced or observed the type of restrictions Robin Hood and other applications performed on January 28th? Thank you, Congressman. No, I have not. Thank you. That's a good question. Uh, and Mr. Huffman, I'm not a redditor, but I do understand the problems around social media and freedom of speech and the tightrope act that goes on where these intersect. In the near decade of the Wall, of Wall Street bets and subreddit. Have they shown themselves to be except, exceptionally problematic, uh, an exceptionally problematic forum, or just one of the many eccentric communities that call Reddit home? Congressman, I think your your latter description is more accurate. They are an eccentric community, um, but they're well within the bounds of our content policy. And though we do have difficult decisions to make here and there regarding specific communities, one of the things we look to first is whether the community is a trying, trying and they're putting their best efforts to be a good citizen of Reddit. And towards that end, we've had consistent communication with the moderators of that community, and they've been doing, I think, an excellent job. Thank you. Well, the last uh, financial crisis was caused when we turned a blind eye to the bad practices of our financial institutions. Perhaps today we've seen a warning about the clearing, clearing process, and I hope today can be a jumping off point for us to take a hard look at our markets and the practices of these institutions. In a two-day clearing process, the liability risk and potential financial stress limited trading, but in a key time in market and perhaps in a way that materially affected investors in these recent events. So um, I'm hoping that we all get to take a closer look at what is happening. And uh, with that, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next on our list, we will have uh, Mr. Hollingsworth uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, Mr. Griffin, I'm going to direct my questions to you specifically, but I'm hoping to talk a little more philosophically about the market writ large rather than just Citadel itself. Certainly, there's been a significant amount of evidence supporting the advantages market makers offer retail investors through sophisticated infrastructure and high speed technology bid ask spreads have decreased from 33 cents to less than a penny over the last five decades. 
And according to some research, saved retail investors 1.6 billion just in the first six months of last year alone. None of our discussion after this and the questions I'm going to ask are intended to be pejorative to that reality. But I just wanted to pick your brain, given your deep experience about some of the implications of off exchange trading specifically. We've seen this year that off exchange trading has eclipsed nearly 50% of all trading. Can you talk a little bit about what factors have contributed to off exchange trading's growth versus on exchange trading? Certainly, I want to talk about the concerns we may have as market participants about that. But first, just the factors that you think are driving that. I think one of the most significant drivers of off exchange trading is that exchanges are handcuffed in their ability to fulsomely compete. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Is this just regulatory arbitrage? It is. I, I hate the word because it has a negative connotation. I believe that the exchanges should have greater latitude in setting their tick sizes in the most liquid securities. Mm -hmm. That will allow order flow that's currently going to dark pools to go to exchanges and to receive better executions. So let me just be very clear. It's not that we want to inhibit dark pools or market makers like Citadel from competing. It's right. that we want to enable and empower exchanges to be better competitors. I started my career as a retail investor in the day where I used to spend 25 cents in a bid ask spread if I was lucky. I know the days you're referring to. We've come a long ways, but to continue on this journey, the next step is to allow exchanges to be more competitive in the market. Well, so I think you answered this question, but just to put a fine point on it, there is public policy work that needs to be done in order to help resolve some of this challenge that exists in the movement of volume from on exchange to off exchange. That's incumbent upon us. It's incumbent upon regulators to find a better solution. Is that what you're saying? Congressman, I'm, I'm saying that, yes, it's legislators or the yeah. SEC. I believe much of this can be done by the SEC as a policy matter. Right. Think of it as the next step forward in regulation NMS. Love it. Great. Thank you for all those answers. Just I want to highlight this further. Can you talk about some of the challenges or deleterious impacts on the market if more and more volume is off exchange versus more? versus lit trading. Can you talk a little bit about why we should be concerned about that to make sure we all understand how important it is to make these changes to empower, as you said, exchanges to be better competitors? I, I think there are three salient points I'd like to make. First, price discovery is the most important part of our capital markets function because price discovery combined with liquidity fuels our free enterprise system. It's how companies raise capital. It drives down the cost of capital. The more trading on exchanges, the better the price discovery we have. That is good for our capital markets. The second is that dark pools are often willing to engage in business practices where they discriminate against one class of investors versus another. I find it very unsettling that we in any way prohibit discrimination against one group of investors for the benefit or at the expense of another in any part of our capital markets. We want our capital markets to represent the values of our country. The third is that the dark pools themselves create a level of concern and apprehension about the integrity and fairness of our markets. And I believe that we should always be taking steps to advance public confidence and the confidence of retail investors and institutional investors that the United States capital markets are a fair place in which to transact business. Mr. Griffin, thank you for those answers. And I would call upon my colleagues to recognize the deep experience Mr. Griffin has in these areas and how important it is that we take the steps either via agency or via legislation to help empower exchanges to compete on a level playing field to make sure that we create a public policy. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Lawson, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, to you and, and Ranking Member uh, McHenry for this uh, forum uh, today. And I want to thank the uh, and welcome the panel uh, panelists uh, to uh, this uh, this great forum. 
Uh, one thing, Madam Chair, I want to clarify for the record is one of my colleagues earlier said that when people got their stimulus money, they went and started investing it. I want to let them know uh, that uh, when my people got their stimulus money, they were trying to pay the rent trying to take care of their kids, and I don't want the panel to think that uh, when we work so hard on stimulus dollars, you know, that that happened, that they, uh, uh, that people are running out to invest uh, their money. That's not the norm. Uh, my question, I, I'm going to direct it to Mr. Uh, 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 uh Wall Street is supposed to uh, be tied to revenue and profit and fundamentals. We saw these fundamental changes uh, when amateurs and investors gained control. Uh, they, they publicly stated that this isn't about investing based on their fundamentals and that this isn't an investment about making a profit uh, in that way. It's about making a profit to demonstrate that they can manipulate the system and if not, better than uh, professionals such as yourself. The rabbit trade won, and Wall Street was losing billions of dollars. Melvin Capital betted against uh, GameStop and was on the verge of bankruptcy. Clearly, there is a manipulation and distrust uh, within the system and inequality in uh, American financing. Mr. Plotkin, do you believe that there is uh, manipulation, distrust, and overall inequality within American, uh, within American financing? And what do you believe are uh, the consequences of big guys like yourself, but also little guys uh, in this process? Um, well, thank you for the question. I, I really can't speculate, you know, in terms of the broader system. I, I think, you know, Melvin, you know, my focus is on running our portfolio and, and, and building a great organization and a strong team. I, I think some of the issues you, you speak about are much greater societally, and it, it's not really my area of expertise. Okay, well, one other thing, you guys have a uh, Series 67 license uh, and everything, but these amateur investors don't have to go through those same standards. And uh, because they do not have to go through those same standards, how are they able to go in and manipulate the market? Maybe someone that can answer uh, over people who have been involved uh, in uh, uh, this research and calculation and and invested for so many years. Can anybody ask how are they able to go in and manipulate the market like this? It cost billions of dollars to be lost. Sure. Look, I, I think, you know, as we've spoken about today, you know, the financial markets are, are changing. There's a lot of new players. Um, you know, I think they saw an opportunity, uh, you know, to drive the price of a stock higher. Uh, and, you know, today with social media and other means, you know, there's the ability to kind of collectively do so. Uh, that was a risk factor that, you know, up until recently, we had never seen. I think, you know, sometimes with retail investors, you think about, and they've been really adept at this, you know, investing in the internet or software stocks or electric vehicles and, you know, thing, you know ideas with, with big opportunities and, and, and they chase them because they believe in the fundamentals. I think this was very different in that a lot of the, the meme stocks, you know, these were businesses with real challenges, um, but they exploited an opportunity, you know, uh, around short interest and, and the way that was approached. And I think, you know, us at Melvin will adapt and I think the whole industry will have to adapt. Well, I, well, I, I understand that. And so I just, from our standpoint, and, and I know I have much more time, but uh, what do you recommend to us uh, to try to keep from letting this happen again? Um, look, I, I think to some degrees, markets are self-correcting. You know, I, I know, you know, moving forward, stocks, I, I don't think you're going to see stocks with the kind of short interest levels that, that we saw, you know, prior to, to this year. I, I don't think, you know, investors like myself want to be susceptible uh, to these type of dynamics. I think there'll be a lot closer monitoring of, of message boards. There'll be software providers. We have a data science team that will be looking at that. You know, whatever regulation that, that you guys come up with, certainly, you know, will abide by. And, and I look forward to, you know, helping, you know, if you guys want to have future conversations about that. Okay, thank you. And Madam Chair, my time is running out, so I yield back. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Gonzalez of Ohio, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I want to thank Ranking Member McHenry for his leadership in calling for this hearing today, uh, and also you, Madam Chair, for bringing us together. Uh, Mr. Tenev, I'm going to start my questions with you uh, by walking through a series of events from that day in January, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, 
So in your testimony, you mentioned that the automated deposit requirements from DTCC came in at 5.11 a.m. Eastern, and it showed a $3 billion deficit, correct? I believe that's correct, yes. Okay. Uh, at that point, 5.11 a.m., did you have the liquidity to meet the additional $3 billion deposit requirement? So uh, as, as we wrote in detail uh, on, in my written testimony, there were, uh, there were a series of steps that the Robinhood Securities team took to- Re Reclaim my time, sir. At that exact moment, did, did you have the liquidity for 3 billion? 5.11 a.m. At, at that moment, uh, we would not have been able to post the 3 billion in collateral. Okay, um, so when you said, and you've said this multiple times that you did in fact have the liquidity and you didn't have a liquidity problem at that moment in time, that is not necessarily true, correct? You had to take steps to get there. Con Congressman, uh, we did have to, the Robinhood securities team had to work with, uh, with our relevant clearing houses to adjust the risk profile of the trading day in order to meet our collateral requirements. Right. Uh, and, and in order to do that, uh, your choice was to throttle trading, to prevent your clients from being able to purchase uh, in certain shares, correct? That's correct. Robin Securities had to uh, restrict buying in about 13 securities. Okay. And if you had not been able to de-risk the profile uh, or the portfolio, excuse me, um, you hadn't, wouldn't been able to raise the money, get the VAR requirement and the excess capital charge waived uh, to de-risk the portfolio, then DTCC would have stepped in and liquidated the portfolio, correct? I'm not sure what the exact, uh, Congressman, what the exact steps that they would take if we weren't in compliance with the deposit requirements would be, but it would not have been a good situation for the firm or the customers. So reclaim my time. Uh, so the letter that Ranking Member McHenry submitted for the record, I, I would I would draw everyone's attention to. I'll just read this. Uh, if a clearing member fails to satisfy a margin call, it exposes other clearing members to risk and can put NSCC out of compliance. In a case of non-payment, NSCC may cease to act for the clearing member and liquidate its unsettled clearing portfolio. Um, so that was definitely on the card in the cards for my constituents who are Robinhood clients. Uh, what would this have done to their portfolio if it would have been forced liquidation as a result of missing the capital call? Oh, well, Congressman, if, uh, if there was forced liquidation, uh, at the very least, it would have resulted in a total lack of access to the markets for your constituents, not just to the 13 securities that we restricted buying in. Right, so this would have been an enormous catastrophe for Robinhood, correct? And the That's correct. And, and not just Robinhood, but the over 13 million customers that we serve. Yeah, and I think that's, that's really sort of the crux of the issue. So in, in a sense, I love your company because it, it does, when correctly managed, provide investment opportunities for individuals who are currently frozen out of the markets for run, one reason or another. Uh, at the same time though, I believe a vulnerability was clearly exposed uh, in your business model and, and perhaps in the, in the regime that governs your capital requirements. Uh, and we just can't live in a world where my constituents could have their shares liquidated without their consent uh, because you all aren't able to make a capital call. I appreciate that you, you were able to ultimately satisfy it, uh, but, but the amount of time you have from 5 a.m. to 10 a.m. to figure this out uh, is, is scary for the company. And, and frankly, I care more about my constituents than anything uh, and scary for them. Um, and so I hope we'll continue to look at that. Beyond that, though, I, I, I also hope that this hearing highlights a very real problem uh, with our financial markets today and how they're accessed by everyday investors. Uh, today, the, the Melvin and Citadels of the world, as well as major PE and VC funds, have access to the world's greatest investment opportunities on the planet, uh, whereas the retail investor world, uh, of which Mr. Gill is a, a great member, uh, it, it doesn't, for lack of a better term, uh, has access to an ever diminishing set of investment opportunities. And so while we're debating these vulnerabilities, we're also serious about finding ways to expand access for Main Street investors. And with that, I yield. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. San Nicholas, you're recognized for five minutes. 
Good morning from Guam, Madam Chair. I've been with uh, the hearing since uh, 3 a.m. The sun is starting to come up out here, uh, but it's uh, always a pleasure to be joining you in, uh, in these very, very important hearings that you call for uh, the American people. Thank you very much. I wanted to first begin by um, uh, congratulating everybody who made money on the Robinhood trade. You know, you guys found a low float, um, low volume, massively shorted stock, and you guys squeezed it. And I think that um, investors like Mr. Plotkin, uh, large money managers, uh, probably doubled down on their short positions thinking that they're going to win. And in the end, the, uh, the massive communication networks that we have these days uh, rallied the small to beat the large. And that, uh, that was absolutely something, something to behold. And, and Robinhood made that possible. Robinhood made that possible. Mr. Tenev, um, you mentioned in your testimony that um, you've secured $3 billion in funding to uh, address the, um, the regulatory deposit requirement situation that you face. Uh, where did that $3 billion come from? Thank you, Congressman, for that question. To be clear, we were in compliance with all regulatory net capital and deposit requirements without the additional capital infusion. It was simply to provide extra cushion, allowing us to unrestrict trading and be prepared for other black swan events that might happen in the future. The capital came from mostly existing venture capital investors that, that Robinhood already had. So, so basically you had to further uh, dilute um, your, your position in, in Robinhood in order to make sure that you secured all of your 13 million customers with that, that, that additional 3 billion. That's correct, Congressman. Well, that, that's where I have a, a serious concern, Mr. Tennant, because um, not only was your business model designed to profit off, off of order flow, which caused you to take extraordinary risks in um, having 13 million customers with access to um, large uh, margin trading that facilitated the GameStop situation, but you halted buys on that stock and you allowed sells in order to mitigate the capital requirement situation and you materially benefited from it. You materially benefited from it because it reduced the amount that you would have had to go out and raise an additional capital in order to prevent um, these kind of crises from reoccurring. You took from your customers in order to minimize the 3 billion from being larger than it probably would have been because you wanted to protect your position. And that, that is very troubling. That is very troubling. It's very troubling that the um, order flow model that you built and the risk that you took on uh, resulted in that halt. And it's very troubling that that halt also materially benefited the, um, the existing um, shareholders and yourself by minimizing the amount of uh, additional capital you had to raise in order to prevent that from happening again. You basically took from the, the shareholders in order to, to, to do that. And that's just, I, I, I don't know what to say about that, but I think that this um, Madam Chair presents a very serious situation where we need to ensure that companies are not taking advantage of customers in this way. Mr. Kenneth, kind of you're quoted as saying in this hearing, buying increases capital requirements, selling does not. So it was something that you knowingly did. It was something that you knowingly did. It, it was beyond just trying to protect the um, existing uh, customers. And it, at the end of the day, while you had to raise an additional three billion, it minimized that from being a larger sum. We have customers who purchase the stock who are now bag holders after the, the price came down because they couldn't continue going up with buying with additional buying. And that was that was willful, that was intentional. So I'm glad, Madam Chair, that we've called this hearing. I'm glad that we're able to put these things on the record. And uh, I'm, I'm just very, very concerned with the implications of this. And I really hope that um, at the end of the day, those bag orders get a lot more than an apology. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Mr. Rose, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and uh, thank you, Ranking Member McHenry, for holding this important hearing today. And thank you to our witnesses for your testimony and 
participation today and for the dedication of time that you've made to this to this hearing. There is still so much for us to learn from this market event. Obviously, speculation has been rampant, and I believe we should not get ahead of our skis, so to speak, and rush to policy recommendations before we understand the full scope of this situation. The committee investigation is barely underway, and I would view a large majority of the policy proposals suggested today as half-baked at this point. At the end of the day, we should all want to want, we should all want retail investors to have access to the market and to ensure they have the information they need to participate in the market in an informed way. Mr. Griffin, my colleague, Representative Laddermilk, asked you to explain the advantages of cutting down on the settlement time, but you were cut off before you could complete your answer. Would you like to finish your thought there? Right, to be brief, the issue in, in going to real time settlement is everything has to work perfectly in a world where there's still people involved in many of the processes. We'll get there one day as an industry. I just think it's a bridge too far in the next couple of years. And then uh, you were also cut off earlier when answering uh, my colleague, Miss Beatty's question regarding the difference between payment for order flow for the options market versus the equities market. Would you like to continue that explanation? I, I think we covered that reasonably well. I think the salient difference is that the options market, every trade must take place on an exchange to start with. In the equities market, the current market structure has been arrived at with the blessing of the SEC as the best way to give retail investors in America price improvement as compared to the exchanges. And to be succinct, we should make exchanges more competitive, not make internalization or dark pools more privileged. Thank you. And, and then finally, uh, Mr. Griffin, earlier Representative Luke Meyer asked about how we got to where GameStop was uh, short sold to 140%. Given that naked shorting is an illegal practice, how did we, how did that happen given current US law? So clearly a number of the purchasers of the short sales, of, of the shares sold short, are institutions that also lend their securities. And it's very important to remember that institutional investors earn substantial returns from participating in the securities lending market. So if you were lending your GameStop stock out, for example, over the period of the recent crisis, you may have been earning an annualized rate of return of 25 or 30% on the shares that you lent out. That accrues to the benefit of pension plans, of ETF, ETFs, of other pools of institutional lending that participate in the securities lending market. And keep in the back of your mind, when a bank lends money to a business, that business may turn around and lend money to its suppliers. Just because in some sense, somebody can on lend what they bought doesn't necessarily mean something has gone wrong in the chain itself. Would you see that as an area right for, for regulatory adjustment or do you think that that's not a problem? I think if we were to think about legislative priorities to make our capital markets work better, this doesn't make the top 100 list. Thank you. Thank you. Despite the intense uh, volume and exposures presented in the markets, the broader infrastructure of our financial markets has performed very well, I believe. My concern, like those of my colleagues, is that forging ahead with new regulations at this point would be harmful and have unforeseen consequences. Um, in the few moments um, that I have left, uh, Ms. Schulp, uh, can you speak to what the potential dangers are of increased regulation uh, to retail investors? Uh, that's going to take me more than 12 seconds, but um, <laughs> there's a lot of potential for unintended consequences here, and increased regulation can drive retail investors out of the market. It can have them have less good prices. Um, you, and, sorry not to give you more time. <laughs> Maybe one of my colleagues will give you a chance to complete that. I yield back. 
Thank you very much. Next, we will have Ms. Axney uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman, and thank you to the witnesses for being here today. I just want to quickly follow up with a question my colleague, Mr. Foster, asked earlier uh, to you, Mr. Tenev. You said that Rule 606 reports detail uh, the arrangements you have with firms like Citadel. However, those only detail the payments you receive. Are you saying that you're uh, prepared to publicly disclose the detailed terms of your payment for order flow uh, with Citadel and other uh, market makers? Thank you for the question, Congresswoman. Uh, the 606 reports do publicly detail the payment for order flow arrangements we have with Citadel Securities and our other market makers. Okay, well, uh, I'll look forward to seeing those details then. Will you make sure that you get those over to, uh, to our committee? Certainly, we can have that arranged. Okay, thank you. Um, last month, of course, as we saw this volatility with GameStop and AMC, um, and the stock started to rally, everybody seemed to get involved. And one survey recently said that 30% of Americans purchased one of those viral stocks. Uh, that includes people like my nephew uh, and his two friends who stayed up until four in the morning to see if they could get a piece of this action. So one of the most concerning pieces, though, of this whole episode is how many people really felt like that's what they needed to do uh, to get ahead. Uh, to me, this just exemplifies the income inequality across America, and it's one that we need to deal with. And I do appreciate the opportunity for retail investing. I want to make sure that it creates a good outcome, however, for the people who are using it. And right now, what I'm seeing is gambling uh, on the stock market, and it's not a real solution to that income inequality. Um, and I don't think we should pretend that it is. Just last June, uh, when Hertz declared bankruptcy, after that, uh, Robinhood was actively uh, pushing the stock on its site. Uh, it was trending on Robinhood, and the promotion of that worthless stock, I don't think, is, uh, is good for investors. That's a gamble that they shouldn't have taken. That's just one example. But people having access to the stock market's nice, but if they don't have the money to invest, um, then really it's not democratization. And that's the real reason that 80% of the stock market's owned by 10% of the people. And of course, those are people who don't have to put all their money into healthcare or childcare or a car payment or you know whatever it is that's just keeping them going through their day to day. Um, earlier, uh, Mr. Tenev, you said that you couldn't tell us what your client's rate of return is, but generally 99% of short-term uh, traders underperform the market. So, Mr. Tenev, you say Robinhood's mission is to democratize finance. Is, is that correct? That's correct, Congresswoman, yes. Okay. So, I want to ask you then, you've invested significantly in behavioral research. And just so you know, I own a digital design firm uh, with my husband. So, I'm familiar with uh, the what behavioral research can do uh, for uh, platforms and websites. Um, and that behavioral research, research has really shaped how your app is designed. Is that correct? Congresswoman, like many technology companies, we employ data scientists, user researchers, and designers to provide a better customer experience okay, and understand so, our customers' needs. So on the specifics, when people sign up, they get a scratch off ticket to see what they get. Confetti falls every time they place an order. They get push notifications. They're encouraged to trade. Um, if a friend signs up, they get a free stock on and on. Why have you added specific gaming design elements to look like gambling to your app? That encourages more frequent trading. Congresswoman, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we want to give people what they want in a responsible, accessible way. We don't believe in gamification. Uh, we know investing is serious, and that's why um, most of our customers are buy and hold. A very small percentage of our customers utilize margin. Well, and I, I appreciate that, but the, you know, folks like my nephew actually aren't your customers. They're your product. Your customers sitting right next to you, uh, Mr. Griffin, with Citadel. So when you don't pay as much for index fund uh, or Apple or anything like that, your app to me shows me that you're really just trying to encourage more trades, which puts more money in your pocket, not helping people build equity through smarter investing. So I would ask you, Mr. Tenev, I'd ask two things. 
who exactly do you believe you're democratizing a finance for and how do you plan to address these conflicts of interest? Well, first of all, I, I believe in our business model, Congresswoman. I believe our business model has become the industry standard for a reason. It's because it's good for customers. It's led to the democratization of the market and it works. And we're very proud to route to market makers on uniform terms without taking into account any of the payments that we generate from them in the routing and based purely on the execution quality that we provide uh, to our customers. Mr. Sile is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you for holding today's hearing. I'm concerned about investors in the state of Wisconsin and across our country to make sure that they have access to the market, access that is fair and equal to the big banks and the hedge funds uh, in Wall Street. And we've seen great improvements in access, uh, the democratization in finance, and I'm concerned uh, that these hearings are going to lead us down the path of additional regulations before we fully investigated the facts. It was stated earlier uh, that that may not be the case, and I'd like to uh, have inserted into the record a Bloomberg article dated January 28, titled GameStop Trades Show Need for More Regulation, Democrat Says. Without objection, such is the order. Thank you. I, I think it'll be helpful for everyone to review that with the concerns uh, being that we're going to drift away from the democratization uh, of our our finance system. Also, a bit disappointed that we don't have representation in our first hearing here today from the SEC or the DTCC, uh, especially in the early days of the Biden administration. I think that that would be helpful and hopefully uh, we'll be able to have their participation in a future hearing. If, if I can direct my first question uh, to Mr. Gabe Plotkin um, at Melvin uh, Capital Management, uh, there's obviously a lot of attention that came pouring in on a stock, game stock, uh, that you held a short position in. Um, it, people were tweeting about it, things were building. Do you have any information as to uniquely why uh, folks uh, on Twitter and on Reddit uh, and others uniquely targeted uh, that stock? Um. First of all, thank you for the question. I, I think it's a really good one. Um, I, I think ultimately, I'm not sure kind of how the momentum built around that. You know, there were certainly some signs, you know, as we kind of diligenced after the fact. I mean, there were even website names bought, like, you know, nasty things about our firm as far back as November. So I'm, I'm not sure kind of how it started, but I think ultimately they saw an opportunity with a very high short interest stock that a lot of people could relate to, uh, you know, because it was a retail uh, experience and, and that's that's sort of the genesis of it. Thank you very much. I'm gonna shift gears over to uh, to Robin Hood uh, and Mr. Tenev, if I can. Is, is, Mr., is my colleague, Mr. Gonzalez was talking about, at some point it became clear uh, that additional collateral would likely be needed um, how many of your customers owned GameStop uh, stock or options on January 27th? I, I don't have the exact numbers. What, what, to suffice it to say, had it increased? Had, suffice it to say, had it increased dramatically over the days leading up uh, to the 27th? Yes, that's accurate. Fair, and and you saw additional uh, order flow coming into this. Did you take any steps, and was it reasonable to believe that there would be additional capital requirements? And did you take any steps, um, either internally or working in concert uh, with the National Securities Clearing Corporation, uh, to, medicate, to mitigate the risk uh, posed by the volatility before uh, the January 28th collateral call? We did. Um, so on January 21st, we went to 100% market requirement for AMC. And uh, that requires all purchases for those stocks to be fully paid for. So you, customers would have been unable to use margin to buy those. So that was January 21st in the case of AMC and January 26th for GME. But this was still insufficient ultimately as related to the collateral call that came in uh, in the early morning hours on the 28th, is that correct? That's correct. The limiting, limiting margin was ultimately insufficient. And as, as you look to uh, your peers, do you know any other uh, brokerages that were putting in place uh, limitations on their buy orders? Yes, uh, I, I do, Congressman. Um, I think that's an important question. Many brokerages put in place uh, similar limitations on buy orders for many of these securities. 
for for the record, I've heard conflicting reports on that. I think it's something that this committee needs to further look into uh, is to the differential between what occurred uh, under your control uh, at Robinhood and some of the other brokerages. I think it's a question that we should uh, fully investigate on this committee, make sure we have all the facts uh, as we're moving forward. Could you detail, uh, Mr. Tenev, your plans going forward uh, as it relates uh, to making sure that an event like this doesn't occur and that you have the foresight to prevent uh, these late collateral needs? Absolutely, Congressman. Thank you for, for that important question. Uh, certainly, the the additional $3.4 billion helps provide a significant cushion. In addition, you could see that between Thursday and Friday, Robinhood replaced uh, the PCO, which is a position closing only setting with much more granular position limits. Uh, Congresswoman Axney. Uh, I'm sorry. Please, uh, um, the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the voice that you heard had nothing to do with uh, what you were saying. I think it was a mistake. Uh, with that, the gentleman's time has expired, and we'll move on uh, to Mr. Caston. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much to our witnesses. Um, I want to. There's a whole bunch of themes in today's hearing, and I want to, if I can, just tie a couple threads together that I think are relevant that have been we've had corners of June. 2020, um, Alex Kearns, who was 20 years old at the time uh, from Naperville, Illinois, killed himself, largely thanks to a, a, a bug in the Robinhood system. The bug was that he turned on the app, said he owed $730,000 that he did not have because of options positions that he thought canceled out but didn't appear to. He called the helpline. The helpline, of course, was not manned, as we've discussed. Um, he sent several panicked emails, three to be precise, did not receive a response. Ultimately, there was a response from the email saying that, in fact, his positions were covered, but by that point, it was too late because he had taken his own life. The, this is a gentleman who was 20 years old. Under Illinois law, he was not allowed to buy a beer, but he was allowed to take on $730,000 in, in positions and exposure that he did not have the liquidity to cover. Now, your mission, Mr. Tenev, is to democratize finance, but the history of financial regulation is to protect people like Alex Kearns um, from the system. As the old joke goes, if you're playing poker and you can't see, figure out who the fish is at the table, um, you should leave the table because you're probably the fish. And there is an innate tension in your business model between democratizing finance, which is a noble calling, and being a conduit to feed fish to sharks. I want to cover a little bit of timeline. December 2019. Robinhood was assessed a $1.25 million fine by FINRA for failing to disclose payment for order flow agreements to your customers. Six months after that, Alex Cairns committed suicide. Six months after that, December 20, Robinhood paid a $65 million fine to the SEC for, among other things, failing to disclose payment for order flow agreements to your customers. There is a tension in your model. Now, along with that, according to your 606s, as been reported by CNBC, you attract a higher rate for equity trades from payment for order flow from any of your competitors. Competitors, excuse me, 17 cents per 100 trades versus about 11 cents for your competitors, even more over 50 cents per 100 trades for options. Um, I'd ask unanimous consent to enter the CNBC article into the record. Without objection, such is the order. Question for you, Mr. Tenev. When did you start offering options on your platform? Thank you, uh, Congressman Kasten. Um, and first, let me say, uh, I'm, I'm really, I'm really just really looking for date. We're tied on, we're tied on time. When did you start offering options? Options trading, uh, was offered starting in Q1 of 2018. Okay. Thank you. That's relevant because prior to 2018, your revenue grew basically linearly with user growth. Your revenue any year for your payment for order flow interview was about $10 per user per year. 2020, it got to $50 per user per year. So your, your revenue model went from growing revenue by growing users to growing revenue by growing revenue earned on the back of each user, consistent with taking on options. How many firms do you route options orders to, Mr. Tenev? Um, Congressman, we have seven market makers. Um, I can get back to you with the precise number for, for <laughs> options under well, seven. According, according to your 606 disclosures, you only list four Citadel, Susquehanna, Wolverine, and Morgan Stanley. Are, are there any others besides the ones listed in your 606 disclosures? 
if if that's in the 606 congressman i'm sure it's accurate okay so do you route options trades to anyone who you do not have a payment for order flow agreement with currently we have uh congressman uniform payment for order flow arrangements with all of our market makers um so they they would all be under the same uh the same arrangements okay so you have so how do you ensure that you're getting best pricing if every single firm you're ruling out anybody who is not paying you for the privilege to, to trade congressman we believe having uniform payment for order flow arrangements with all market makers ensures structurally that there is no conflict of interest because it prevents payment for order flow from being an input in decision making for where to route orders okay i'm i'm almost out of time but there is an innate conflict in your model let's imagine right now that we are today's version of Alex Burns. i'm nervous i think i've got an exposure and i call your helpline now let's call and let's listen in the time we have remaining to what i'm going to hear on the other end of the phone thanks for calling robin hood please visit us at robinhood.com or on our app for support if you have an urgent trading need please make sure to include details of your order when reaching out Thanks and have a great day. Well, Mr. Caston, you, you may wrap up. I back my time. You may wrap up. Go ahead, Mr. Caston. I, I have no further questions, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I will now call on Mr. Gooden uh, for five minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Is Mr. Gooden on the line? Madam Chair, Mr. Gooden's in Texas and he's unavailable to. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, then let us hear from, um, I believe it would be at this time, Mr. Timmons. For five minutes. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. It, it seems we're here today to try to find culpability in the events that transpired last month. Um, you know, it, I seem to spend a lot of my time thinking about capital requirements and um, the time it takes to execute these trades. So I'm going to focus my questions there. Um, Mr. Tenev, you have repeatedly invoked capital requirements that both your company and your clearinghouse are required to abide by in order to explain the restriction of trading last month. My friend and colleague, Mr. Barr, asked you about this earlier, but I would like to hone in on this a little bit. Could you explain what specifically about the nature or volume of the trades being ordered by your customers caused these increased capital requirements to be triggered? And how did the level of collateral required compare to what you would normally have to abide by? Uh, thank you for that question, Congressman. So uh, to give you a, a sense for the increase, our capital requirements, our deposit requirements with NSCC uh, from January 25th to January 28th, so a span of three days, increased tenfold. What is the most your capital requirements had been prior to this event? Um, I believe there was a table, Congressman, that I provided in my written, written testimony that had um, the, the precise value at risk and special charges in the prior days. Um, so, uh, Happy to refer obviously to that. It, it it never been close to this amount, and um, now you have additional capital that you've raised, and so uh, this should not happen again. Again, I think you referenced one in three and a half million um, was the likelihood of this situation occurring. Is that correct? That's correct, and that's not a Robin Hood number. That's actually uh, a third party industry number. Uh, are you aware of the origin of these capital requirements? I, I do believe that these capital requirements and specifically the NSCC deposit was spelled out in Dodd-Frank. So the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act is arguably uh, to blame for what happened. You would not have halted trading um, in this case, but for this exorbitant capital requirement that you were unable to meet. So. Um, I, I think that when we're searching for culpability, um, we need to realize that the well intent, the well intentioned um, legislation from over 10 years ago is, is somewhat culpable in, in, this, in, in this entire conversation. Um, Ms. Schultz, 
will you elaborate on that? Do you do you agree that um, Dodd Frank is somewhat responsible for the situation that Robin Hood found themselves in? I think the capital requirements in Dodd Frank can be seen as responsible. I think it's incumbent on us to uh, to evaluate those capital requirements and whether they are appropriate um, given the business models at issue. I think that's also a question of settlement times and modernizing our system. But but I agree that, that the capital requirements here put into place are one of the reasons that we're having these conversations today. And you went to the next place I wanted to go, which is the time it takes to settle these transactions. So, um, you know, 12 years ago, 10, 10, 11 years ago, we never really considered the whole concept of a Robin Hood, of an app based uh, trade platform that uh, democratizes uh, access to purchasing uh, and selling um, publicly traded companies. So I, I do think that that needs to be revisited, especially because it is unfair. Um, there are other companies that have far more resources that are not in the situation and those companies have larger investors. So we really are picking on the little guy in this entire conversation. So between um, reconsidering capital requirements for um, retail investor platforms, number one, and number two, trying to find a way to, to settle these transactions faster, those two uh, things seem to be the best way to uh, achieve our objective of making sure this doesn't happen again. Um, I, I do hope that we can hear from uh, Michael Bodson from the DTCC in the next hearing, or um, perhaps someone from the NSC. Um, I'm hearing something strange on my computer. I'm sorry, one second. Um, thank you. Um, you know, I, I'll end with this. Um, one of my colleagues across the aisle said, the debt is stacked against the little guy, and I couldn't agree more. But in this case, the very committee um, that is conducting this hearing has has more culpability, I would say, than any of the witnesses that we have brought before us today. So um, we need to make sure this doesn't happen again. I look forward to working with my colleagues across the aisle. With that, I yield back. Thank you. This has expired. At the request of one of our witnesses, we will take a short recess. The committee stands in recess for five minutes.
will come to order. Mr. Torres, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. One of the concerns about payment for order is that it creates a perverse incentive for a brokerage firm like Robinhood to send retail orders not to the firms that provide the best execution to retail investors, but rather to firms that provide the highest payment to Robinhood. There's a concern about a conflict between the interest of brokers and the interest of retail investors. And that concern seems to have been vindicated by the conduct of Robinhood. Uh, SEC previously found that Robinhood misled its customers about how it makes its money. Both SEC and FINRA previously found that Robinhood failed to ensure the best execution for retail customers, depriving those customers of $34 million, resulting in a $65 million civil penalty from the SEC. Uh, my first question for the CEO of Robinhood, how much of your revenue comes from payment for order flow? Thank you, uh, Congressman. Uh, let me first state regulatory compliance is at the center of everything that we do. I, I want to reclaim my time. Things how, right. how, how, much of your, how much of your revenue comes from payment for order flow? The answer to the question is asked, given the time constraints. Congressman, I, I, I don't recall the exact percentage. Uh, it's over 50%. And uh, how much do you know how much of your order flow revenue comes specifically from Citadel? Uh, Citadel is indeed a important counterparty. It's our largest counterparty in terms of where we route orders to. And I want to explain that a little bit, Congressman. Well, I, I want to move on because I, I do have to, I want to cover the concerns about gamification. The, the stated mission of Robinhood is the democratization of finance, but I worry about the real, I worry that the real world impact of Robinhood is the democratization of financial addiction. You know, Robinhood has gaming features that seem to manipulate retail traders into making rash and reckless and potentially ruinous investments. We all know the tra tragic story of Alexander Kearns. Uh, according to a memo from the Financial Services Committee, there's one feature in particular that encourages retail investors to tap on the Robinhood app up to a thousand times a day in order to improve their position on the wait list for Robinhood highly coveted cash management feature. Do, do, do you share my concern that a retail trader tapping on a Robinhood app a thousand times a day is a sign of addiction? Congressman, that particular feature that you're discussing was to get access to our debit card plus high yield savings product, um, which is one of the many many features targeting passive investors that we've rolled out over the past Mr. Tenev, a thousand times a day you you are encouraging your customers to tap on an app a thousand times a day that that to me is a sign of addiction and it worries me that you fail to see it in the same light congressman uh we didn't encourage anyone to tap on anything um to get access to the debit card, people were placed on a wait list. And we wanted to give our customers delightful features uh, so that they know that we're listening to them and that we care about them. And this is just one example of how we add, uh, we add uh, great features that customers love to our products. Look, addictive trading might be bad for your customers, but it's, it's not, but it's good for, for Robinhood, addictive trading means more trading and more trading means more money for Robinhood. There's a sense in which Robinhood monetizes addiction. Uh, you make money from the quantity rather than the quality of trading. I want to, you know, much has been said about price improvement. Uh, one of the arguments for payment for order flow is price improvement. According to the Wall Street Journal, Citadel Securities claims to have saved investors a total of $1.3 billion last year, but I'm wondering how can Citadel possibly know how much it saves retail investors? Citadel does not transact directly with retail investors, it transacts directly with brokers. And, and even if you stipulate that there has been a cost savings, it's unclear to me how much of that cost savings is being passed on to the retail investors and how much of that cost savings is actually being pocketed by Robinhood as profit, right? We know that there's no commission, there's no visible fee at the front end of the transaction, but what is the hidden cost to investors at the back end of the transaction? Can you give me clarity about the hidden cost to investors? Mr. Congressman, I, I appreciate the question. I think that's a very important question. Uh, 
In 2020, Robinhood provided our customers in excess of $1 billion in price improvement. So that price improvement is measured relative to the NBBO, the National Best Bid and Best Offer, which is the reference price per security on all, all major lit exchanges. I ran out of time, so I will, I will yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, you need to help with it. Okay, uh, we were having a technical problem here, uh, but I think it has been corrected. Mr. Taylor, you're recognized for five minutes. Okay. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll point out uh, that today and this week has been very hard uh, for my home state of Texas and for my, my district in Collin County. We have uh, faced uh, um, a, a record-breaking freeze across the state, which has uh, crushed our power generation capability. And uh, we have had some really heartbreaking stories of need. In fact, during this hearing, I was called away to help a mayor uh, try to get power back to their, their water pumping stations to get make sure that they have water for their citizens uh, in Anna, Texas today. So for those members of the committee, I encourage you to uh, send your thoughts and prayers to the people of Texas uh, as they as they go through this really challenging time. Uh, on to the topic of this, this hearing, Mr. Tennant, I just wanted to go in, I know there's been a lot of questions about, about the margin call that you got on the morning of the 28th of January, uh, but I'm not sure that we really understand how the margin call changed from 3 billion to 1.5 billion to 600 million. Can you sort of go through how did you negotiate the, the margin call down? And I mean, and these are, very sizable decreases, right? You're saying 50% to 50% again uh, to, to uh, something that you could then in turn manage. How did you do, how did you decrease the margin call? Uh, I'm sorry, you're on mute. You're still on mute. I haven't been able to hear a word you said, unfortunately. How about now? I, I can hear you now. Madam Chair, can I have 30 okay. seconds back for you for that? Okay. Uh, Congressman, I appreciate the question. And first, uh, I wanna send my thoughts and prayers to the people of the great state of Texas. Uh, I appreciate you mentioning that. Um, I'd like to just refer to my written testimony, which gives the detailed TikTok of everything that happened, uh, I believe pages nine to 11. Uh, no, I, I've, I've read, I've read that. I don't, but like, did you go in and say, Hey, you need 3 billion, but Hey, I'll, I won't sell these stocks if, if you reduce it. And then, and that's how you got to the point where people could only sell the stock, not buy it. Is that, is that what you did? I, I believe, um, cause that's, that's not in your written testimony. So I, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to get your answer. I, I don't believe we had made any decisions on PCOing the stocks between the initial three billion request and the subsequent 1.4 billion request. Uh, but between the 1.4 billion and the roughly 700 million, uh, mm -hmm. there was a, a discussion with uh, between our operational team at Robinhood Securities and their relevant counterparts at NSCC regarding what measures we intend to take to lower the risk of our portfolio. 
Okay, so in other words, if you had three billion, you, your your customers would have been able to do everything they wanted to do, including purchase more Game GameStop. Is that correct? I, I don't want to speculate uh, on that. You know, if we had infinite capital, certainly. Um, but I think it's also important to note, Congressman, that this was an evolving situation. We hadn't seen it before. Um, we, we, we had no idea what Friday would have looked like had we been able to, um, to allow customers to buy these securities unrestricted on Thursday. So I, I think it's difficult to speculate exactly how things would have been different. But, but I mean, isn't the reason they said you need $3 billion because your customers wanted to buy GameStop and then by saying, hey, they can't buy it, they can only sell it, that reduced the capital that you needed? I mean, I, it seems to me that's what happened, but I'm just trying to get it. Uh, they, they weren't saying um, specifically that uh, nobody, I, I believe, didn't want our customers to buy GameStop. Uh, these are regulatory mandated deposit requirements, Congressman, that we had to comply with that were heavily influenced by the concentrated activity in GameStop, AMC, and the other securities. Well, wouldn't wouldn't it be fair to say that that your firm was undercapitalized to allow your customers to do what it is that you wanted them to be able to do? Um, I, I think, Congressman, um, you know that in, in this case, certainly, if we had the additional capital, we would have been able to ease restrictions or perhaps, with sufficient capital, unrestrict altogether. Uh, I think it's important to note. Lots of other firms did essentially similar things, if not the same thing, in restricting the buying. Uh, so this was really more of a systemic problem rather than a uniquely Robin Hood problem. But didn't the fact that you went out, raised more capital so that you can actually answer this problem in the future, doesn't that also belie that you were undercapitalized on the 28th of January? Uh, again, Congressman, we met all of our regulatory capital requirements and yeah, uh, deposit requirements. Your customers, your customers wanted to buy the stock. You wouldn't let them do it because you didn't have the capital to allow them to do it, right? Yes, we were. We we didn't have the the deposit requirements. I think, that, I think that's really a, a core problem that, that I think this committee uh, hearing has shown me is that is that you were unfortunately undercapitalized to help your customers do what they wanted to do. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Emmer. You're recognized for five minutes. I thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. Am I right side up? I believe I am. Uh, Mr. Gill, uh, as uh, was previously uh, noted at this hearing, uh, one of your colleagues uh, at the witness uh, table has as many as five people in the room with him. I, I guess, Mr. Gill, my first question for you is how many people are in the room with you right now? Mr. Gill? Zero, Congressman. Gone? Right. That's, uh, that's, that's what I thought, Mr. Gill. And I just want to note uh, for the uh, entire committee that Mr. Gill is actually appearing before our panel by himself, while many others are receiving significant underestimating the sophistication and the independence of uh, uh, of these uh, individual investors. Now, we've heard a lot of reasons for concern today. Some are legitimate, but also some proposed overreactions by members of Congress that could create even more problems. Attention has been given to the positive sides of this story. This other temporarily limiting its investors from trading, which deserves an investigation. What we saw was a movement of individuals investing to try to make money. I don't see what's wrong with that. Even if that motivation is fueled by a desire to stick it to a hedge fund they don't like. Mr. Gill, you're the only retail investor involved in this GameStop situation on our panel today. Why, I don't know, but you are. Yet members on the committee have hardly asked you any questions. We've heard from a lot of uh, the companies and funds involved in this event, but we've barely heard from the people that made this happen. Is there anything you would like to add to this hearing that you haven't been able to add yet, given that we're past the four hour mark on this hearing? I appreciate that, Congressman. I do. I don't have anything to add at this time, just that I would be the first to acknowledge that investing in stocks and options is incredibly risky, and it's so important for people to do their own thorough research before investing. 
But that said, I, I tend to agree with you that um, uh, folks should be able to freely express their express their views on a stock, and um, they should be able to, to to buy or not buy a stock based on those views that they may have. Hey, Mr. Gill, on that note, so how would you feel if these brilliant people that are asking you these questions today decided that uh, you should not take the risks that you uh, that you're making? these thoughtful decisions on. Uh, what do you think about that? I would probably ask for an explanation, Congressman, um, and to try to understand their viewpoint as to why they might think that, and perhaps we'd be able to talk through it. Right. I, I appreciate it, Mr. Gill. I, I think we need to value the right of the individual to make decisions for themselves, and it's fantastic to see so many people getting involved and participating in the greatest financial markets in the world. Uh, we should be encouraging individual participation in the market by you and others. And we should want more people, more, not less. We don't need the people from the mountaintop deciding who's capable and who's incapable. We need more people having the opportunity to develop financial literacy, to build their own portfolios, to secure a safe and comfortable retirement, to grow their wealth so they can send their kids to college. And most importantly, in my opinion, we should strive for individuals to have the autonomy to do all that they themselves would want to do without having to rely on others or, God forbid, their government. I also want to thank Mr. Bud for using his time to mention blockchain technology applications and the post-trade settlement and clearing process. In light of this whole situation, it's important now more than ever that we utilize the technology that we have access to and we don't have access to technology, and we do, I'm sorry, have access to technology that is decentralized and can provide real-time trade settlements. Mr. Lynch and I have a nonpartisan bill that we introduced at reintroduce very soon that concerns this. If we should exercise oversight of anything here, it's to ensure that individuals maintain access to our markets, individual investors. And discussions about over and undervalued companies only continue to increase. Unfortunately, average investors were locked out of the markets at a time of extreme volatility, while institutional investors were not. Well, I'd understand that a lot of what happened during this market frenzy came down to liquidity issues. Individual investors were in a vulnerable position and were at the will of online brokerage. We should be taking this time to discuss how to move forward in a way that promotes market access to all investors, just like it did last month. Chris clearly does not understand what credit is and how you utilize social media and catalyze the market movement. We've significantly this time has underestimated the sophistication of America's retail investors, and we've not been focusing on improving market access. The gentleman's uh, time has expired. Uh, Chair, You're recognized for five minutes. Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, speaking for the for the families of the 8th Congressional District, we just want uh, the gentleman from Texas to know that we are indeed praying for all the good people of Texas uh, and uh, hope you come out okay and uh, get the power that you need. Uh, I do want to follow up with uh, on Mr. Perlmutter's questions, Mr. Gill. Uh, I represent uh, the 8th Congressional District, which includes Brockton, Massachusetts, uh, your home. So I figure I, more than anyone, owe you the opportunity to to respond, but you, you earlier said that uh, that you began your your trading in GameStop when it was around five dollars a share, uh, with the hope that it it might go to twenty or twenty five. And 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 I want to say I I accept your your analysis, your initial analysis that uh, GameStop was undervalued, and, and I I think your belief was sincere, and and I think it was fact based. And in your defense, we are talking about GameStop, right? Uh, it's a, you know, a shopping mall retailer. Uh, we all know it. It's a well-known commodity. Uh, but it, at some at some point, the stock really takes off, right? It it goes from five dollars to a hundred dollars to two hundred dollars to three hundred dollars. It 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 gains escape velocity, as they say, and 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 it ends up almost five hundred dollars a share. Uh, so we're still, but we're still in the midst of a pandemic, right? And you can land a jumbo jet in the parking lot of the Westgate Mall in Brockton or any major <laughs> mall 
in America, right? So no one's going to the malls. Nobody's nobody's feeding this company, and uh, so it's up around four hundred, five hundred dollars. Is there a, a role for someone to play here, for you to play, or or the SEC or Robin Hood uh, to say, okay, it had the price has this di price dislocation has become detached from reality, and and a note of caution might be given to to other day traders and and uh, individuals retailers retail traders who might get jammed if they get into this trade. You, from your perspective, I mean, you've got a unique perspective. What do you think is the proper thing that should have happened? At some point, this thing got away from you and, and went totally into the stratosphere. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on, on how this should have worked. Thank you, Congressman Lynch. I do know Westgate Mall quite well. Um, I would say that just to be clear, I had thought that maybe roughly 20 to $25 per share. Um, uh, I had thought that at that time, but investment theses, they evolve over time. As uh, the fundamental events change over time, it's important to update theses accordingly. And I had mentioned that it appeared as though the stock price had got a little bit ahead of itself last month. Uh, but there's a lot outstanding. There's a lot that has happened in recent months to suggest that GameStop could indeed turn around its business significantly, and one big element of that is indeed one of the largest inv investors uh, in GameStop, Ryan Cohen, and he has brought in some uh, some colleagues uh, that um, yeah, that could gonna... help him turn around this company, and uh, right, their value reclaim... could indeed. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I want to reclaim my time, uh, Ms. Schulp. Uh, I want to ask you. So we got this convergence between fintech, social media, and and the traditional markets, and. Uh, if anything, the GameStop incident and uh, the, the, the convergence of all this has demonstrated a certain uh, vulnerability in our, in our markets. And I'm, I'm just wondering if, if a loosely associated association of, of day traders could call, cause all of this upset in our markets. Uh, isn't there a wider national security uh, issue that's out there uh, in terms of other people who might be nefarious actors who are actually intentionally trying to uh, disrupt our markets. Isn't there a, a, a national security dimension to all of this as well? Again, I can say that national security is not my area of expertise, but to the extent that the market is something more specific then. So, uh, so FINRA, you said earlier that you were with FINRA. They're under uh, regulation SCI. Uh, is there is there is it appropriate to put some of these trading platforms under that same regulation, which requires them to uh, you know develop systems and policies that protect the integrity of their systems? I think protecting the integrity of systems is important for all trading platforms, um, not simply um, the Robin Hoods of the world. Um, we need to look to make sure that there is integrity on the, the platforms. And I, I would agree with that. Um, not necessarily reg SCI in particular, uh -oh. but, but having platforms that are strong is important here. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a few technical difficulties and we'll be right back. And we are back. Thank you very much. Ms. Adams, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, it's been um, it's been a very interesting uh, meeting. I do want to thank you for uh, for organizing this. I think it's been very certainly very helpful. Uh, Ms. Schultz, uh, let me uh, ask you uh, first of all. In the case of GameStop and AMC stocks, the prevailing narrative has been that a band of Reddit-inspired folks rose up against Wall Street forced a short squeeze by professional hedge fund, ma fund managers who were forced to cover their negative bets or risk catastrophic losses. But according to a JP Morgan analyst, several signs are pointing to institutional investors as big drivers of, of the wild price action on the way up. In your opinion, and based on historical data on retail investors' ability to move the markets, what is the likelihood 
that game stock and AMC's market uh, volatility was largely driven by institutional investors looking to ride the wave. Look, I think these are questions that we are going to find out the answers to as we get deeper into the data. But I think that it's likely that at some point in this increase in value for all of these stocks, institutional investors were involved. Um, retail investors traditionally have not been able to move markets in the same way, but it's important to note here that these were not large stocks to begin with. Um, this was not a, a massive increase in price in Apple or Google. Um, it was GameStop, a much smaller company. So, so the ability of retail investors to have outsized influence here um, is entirely possible as well. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Griffin, Mr. Uh, Plotnik, uh, do you have any thoughts on this likelihood as well? Congresswoman, I believe you are asking one of the single most important questions posed today. And I believe that the decline in the short interest as reported over the two week period of time, that the US updates short interest reporting every other week indicates that roughly, and I apologize for not having the exact number, but roughly 35 to 40 million shares were bought back by parties that were short the stock. This would be a dramatic degree of short covering that could cause a dramatic increase in the price of GameStop. Okay, thank you, Mr. Plotnik. Yeah, hi, uh, thank you for the question. You know, I, I think, uh, I mean, I don't have the exact answer to your question. I, I do think it's worth noting that, you know, as, as the stock price moved higher, you know, there was a three day period where it, it traded almost 11 times the entire float. And so I think that kind of volume gave anyone who was short ample opportunity to cover and, and probably suggest tremendous either frenzied buying or institutional buying or some sort of combination. We did look at some of the options activity in the stock. And, you know, on Friday, January 22nd, there was options that were expiring that, that would have equated to 35 to 40 million shares of stock ownership. So I, I actually don't think the short covering was the biggest driver of the stock. When you kind of look at the volume, I really think the biggest driver was the aggressive options activity. Um, and, and then whether it was institutional or retail, just the collective buying. Okay, Mr. Griffin, uh, prior to the game stock uh, volatility in January, did Citadel have any investments in Melvin Capital? And if so, how much, uh, Mr. Griffin? So we first invested in Melvin Capital the Monday of the week in question. I wanna say that that was the 24th of January. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, we had had no investment with Melvin Capital. Obviously, Gabe Plotkin, by reputation, one of the best money managers of his generation, well known to my partners here at Citadel. Gabe actually trained one of my best portfolio managers that worked with me over the course of his career. So well known to my colleagues here at Citadel. Okay, Mr. Plotnik, uh, can you confirm that you worked at Citadel LLC before? He trained oh, my, my portfolio manager Okay. For Gabe at a different firm and then joined Citadel subsequently. Okay. All right. So, Mr. Plotkin, uh, can you confirm that uh, you worked at Citadel LLC before eventually starting your own hedge fund, uh, Melvin Capital, in 2014? I, when I was 23 years old, uh, I worked at Citadel for one year. Okay. Did you solicit or receive any advice from Mr. Griffin? during the game stock volatility uh, that occurred in January? All my conversations with Mr. Griffin really centered around his investment uh, in our firm. Okay, and did you, did you reach out to Citadel or 172 for the significant investments? The gentlewoman's time has expired. Right. Thank you, Madam Chair, I yield back. You're welcome. Ms. Talib, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, hello, everyone. I'm so glad that we're having this hearing. I'm, I'm super appreciative of the leadership of our chairwoman, uh, at least having some sort of transparency on exactly what happened. As we all know, the wealthiest 10% own 84% of all stocks. In fact, 50% of American families own no stock at all. I say this to emphasize that to many of my residents, the stock market is a simply a, a casino for the rich whose gambling hurts pension and retirement funds. 
And when you all screw up, the people end up paying the tab through losses or bailouts. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about the high frequency trading. We know about half of all stock trading in the US is done by computers. They analyze market activity and instantly complete trades at a profit. So this high frequency trading allows Wall Street traders to get ahead of transactions done by pension accounts and retirement funds. So Mr. Griffin, and this truly is a yes or no question. Is Citadel's trading algorithm programmed to identify and trade ahead of large trades done by pension and retirement funds? Yes or no? Congresswoman, today, virtually all trades executed by institutional investors are in the form of program trades such as VWAP and other algorithm trades. So that's a yes, right, Mr. Griffin? Just no, so it's clear. I, I, I'm answering the question. It's a very complex question that deserves an appropriate level of answer. Okay. These VWAP trades are not large trades that you can, it's not like there's 10 million shares about to be bought. It is a trade that is sliced into small slices, 100 or 200 shares, and executed over the course of a day, a week, or a month. Well, help me out with this one. Does this increase cost, this kind of algorithm or whatever uh, program to identify uh, and, and trade, you know, the computers doing the training, does this increase costs for people who have pension and retirement funds, yes or no? So given that we, for example, manage money on behalf of pension. Oh, well, I just, I really, because they're so timed, this is not out of disrespect. It, we just got no, a limited we, time. We use, we use VWAP orders to execute on behalf of our hedge fund and have yes. generated exceptional returns for pension plans and for endowments. So. Well, I'm going to help you out. I'm going to help you out, Mr. Griffin. In effect, some estimates indicate that as a result of the high frequency trading, though, pension and retirement accounts pay nearly $5 billion in a tax. This means that Wall Street firms like yours engaging in high frequency trades are actually making money at the expense of my residents' retirement funds. So one way to ensure that this enormous wealth generated on Wall Street actually reaches the real economy, y'all, you know, what's happening right here in our communities and in my district is to enact and look at proposals like a financial tra transaction tax. And let me tell you, according to recent polling, the majority of Americans, all of you need to hear this, and it's going to grow. The majority of Americans support taxing Wall Street uh, transactions, taxing them at just 0.1% would actually raise $800 billion over 10 years, which could fund programs like helping my district expand healthcare, nutrition, public education. I heard my friend from Texas, who we all are praying all the families will be taken care of, talk about access to water and electricity. But guess what? Right now in my community, it's so poor that I have families melting snow so they can flush their toilets because they have no access to water. So this tax to me would discourage risky and high frequency trading, unfair high frequency trading. Mr. Griffin, does Citadel's lobbyist right now been hired to oppose federal proposals to uh, financial transaction tax because it would make high frequency trading less profitable? So we firmly believe that a transaction tax will injure Americans hoping to save for retirement. Yeah. I believe that Vanguard has publicly come out and said that we'd have to work about two and a half years. Well, later. I want to make this. Yeah, I'd like to finish. Oh, my I, want to, I think it's, it's important. Oh, no, no, I'm reclaiming my tariff and imposes 0.2% tax on transactions as a result and sees little high frequency trading. But this hasn't stopped the Hong Kong stock market from thriving or becoming the lar third largest in the world after New York and London. So it, just to be clear, let's not gas like the American people. Y'all be fine with the tax and it's fair because let me tell you our folks are are tired of bailing you all out when you screw up and gamble with the retirement fund and that's exactly what happens every single moment and that's the reason why we're having this hearing is that sometimes you are irresponsible and it's set up in a way that helps only the wealthy and leaves people like my community here with this large income inequality that i feel like never ever gets the bailout it deserves thank you so much i yield Thank you very much. Ms. Dean, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman. And I appreciate this opportunity for this hearing to get detailed information and to gather the facts as to what happened over the course of these transactions. 
Uh, so let me start by saying, uh, and I saw that members on both sides of the aisle are interested in this question. The core question that I'm going to be asking is, what did the customers know? What did the users know? And when did they know it? That's the theme of what I want to ask, because I believe if we understand what happened and what they knew and what they didn't, we're going to be able to prevent some of the harm in the future. So let's go to the narrative. Mr. Uh, Tanev, uh, I want to take a look at your page nine. Uh, you said that at approximately 5 11 a.m., Robinhood Securities received the automated, uh, automated notice saying that you had a deposit deficit of approximately $3 billion. You then said between 6 between 6.30 and 7.30 Eastern Standard Time, Robinhood decided to impose the trading restrictions, meaning no more purchases of GameStop. And you said in your testimony, in conversations with NSCC staff early that morning, you notified NSCC of your intention. In that time period from 5.11 to uh, the time you were having the conversations, what did you tell your users? What notice did they have? Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, I believe uh, during that time period, shortly after the restrictions on purchasing of these relevant securities were made, uh, we communicated to users, to our customers, that these securities would be restricted from purchasing. And then subsequent, we issued yeah. blog communications and communications on social media explaining the reason being enhanced deposit requirements due to high volatility. I'm going to ask you to be much more specific because in your testimony, you wrote that you offered three different ways of notification. You said that first, the notification to your customers was what they agreed to in their customer opening agreement. That was your first backstop, uh, which who knows what that boilerplate said or when customers or users agreed to it. Number two, you said they were notified two days later by SEC alert. And we know what that SEC alert was. It was quite general, uh, much more vague. Then number three, you said you also list a more ambiguous mention of targeted messages to customers. When did you specifically send your customers an alert? This is what we have had to do because we were short capital. When did you do that? What time? What's the clock? I, I believe, uh, Congresswoman, that that happened at several different points in time. Uh, there was a blog post no, that was published in the what? afternoon Pacific time. Um, what? I, I don't recall the specific time. Maybe it's in, it perhaps it's in my written testimony. Notice? Would it be after the SEC notice? It seems to me you didn't notify your customers for at least two days. You relied upon the SEC notice two days later. Would I be correct? Congresswoman, that, that's inaccurate. Uh, customers were notified several times uh, on that day, and they were notified of other restrictions as they happened days prior to January 28th as well. But you don't say what those notifications were in your testimony. What did you notify them? Specifically, what would I, a user, have heard from you immediately upon your imposing the restrictions? So, Congresswoman, immediately upon uh, imposing the restrictions, customers would have received communications saying that uh, they would be prevented from opening further positions in the relevant securities. Uh, later on the day, on January 28th, uh, around uh, early afternoon Pacific time, we published a blog post that explained that the decision to restrict these uh, these securities was due to collateral requirements at NSCC and clearing houses and not uh, uh, on the direction of Forgive special me. interests or hedge funds. Forgive me. Let me interrupt you there. You admitted to making mistakes. Specifically, what mistakes did you make? I, I, I admit to always improving and uh, certainly we're not going to be public. We're not going to be uh, perfect and uh, we want to improve and, and make sure that we don't make the same mistakes twice. But what were those mistakes? That's what we're here to learn about. Um, I think that, uh, thank you for the question. It's, it's an important question. Um, on Thursday, we did restrict the buying of these securities. On Friday, we imposed position limits, which I believe was uh, uh, 
a much better long-term solution, one that we'll have in the future if anything like this happens again. We also raised $3.4 billion in capital to allow our customers to Thank you. Uh, I yield back. I see my time has expired. Thank you very much, Mr. Tanev. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll go to Ms. Ocasio-Cortez for five minutes. Thank you so much, Madam Chairwoman. Um, Mr. Tanev, Robinhood has engaged in a track record of outages, design failures, and most recently what appears to be a failure to properly account for your own internal risk. You've previously tried to blame clearinghouses for your need um, and scrambled to raise some $3.4 billion in a matter of days, but you've also you know, blamed a lack of industry-wide real-time settlement, or rather a lack of that uh, settlement of trades. Um, you know, but Robinhood's requirements for margin have long been far more lax than other brokers for a long time. With, you know, in December, just a couple months ago, you bragged about having some of the most competitive rates in the industry. And this is evidenced by your recent decision to raise those requirements. Um, when Robinhood prohibited its customers from purchasing additional shares of several stocks, other brokerage, brokerages merely adjusted the margin requirements on these stocks. Uh, so, Mr. Tanev, given Robinhood's track record, isn't it possible that the issue is not clearing houses, but the fact that you simply didn't manage your own book or failed to appropriately manage your own margin rules or failed to manage your own internal risks? Thank you for this question, Congresswoman. Uh, let me address the margin point because I think this is an important one that has been um, under discussed. So in December, when we lowered our margin rates to 2.5%, one of the details that I think was missed is that most other brokerages have tiered margin rates where the wealthier customers pay much lower margin rates than lower net worth customers. So you'll have someone that has $10,000 paying 9 to 10% for margin whereas someone with a million dollars pays 2%. So our approach was give everyone a uniform rate so that wealthier customers are not advantaged uh, with lower rates than, than lower income customers. And I think that's a unique approach in our industry and is representative. Thank you, I, ha I have to apologize. I have to reclaim my time for questioning. Um, you know, as many of my colleagues have also pointed out, Robinhood generates much of its revenue from the payment for order flow arrangements with market makers like Citadel, um, as well as Two Sigma and Virtue. And in 2016, the SEC highlighted ways that the payment for order flow created a quote, potential conflict of interest with a broker's duty of best execution. And then one of the ideas that the commission floated in 2016 for addressing these conflicts of interest was to require that brokers pass on the proceeds of a payment for order flow. Now, um, earlier, one of my colleagues, uh, San, uh, Representative San Nicolas, said that uh, Robinhood owes its customers a lot more than an apology. And I happen to agree with him. I believe that the decisions made by you and this company have harmed your, your customers. Um, Mr. Tenev, would you be willing to commit today to voluntarily pass on the proceeds of the payment for order flow to Robinhood customers? Congresswoman, I, I appreciate that question. When, uh, when the statement you refer to was made, uh, I believe 2015 or 2016, it was before Robinhood forced the entire industry to drop commissions and replicate our business model, which made payment so for is that a, 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 a I should take that as a no. You're not willing to pass on the proceeds of payment for order flow to your customers? When when uh, the other brokers dropped- no, I'm just talking about today, right now. Payment for order flow, Congresswoman, allows for commission-free trading. In the mm -hmm. context of trading commissions, um, it's a much larger source of revenue in the past than payment- Mr. Tanev, I, I apologize, and it's- I. I don't want to be rude. I just have limited time. Um, but if removing the revenues that you make from a payment for order flow uh, would cause the removal of free commissions, doesn't that mean that trading on Robinhood isn't actually free to begin with? Because you're just hiding the cost, the cost in terms of potentially poor execution or the cost of lost rebates to your customers. So certainly, Congresswoman, Robinhood is a for-profit business and needs to generate some revenue to 
to, to pay for the costs of running this business. People were initially skeptical that the model, even with payment for order flow, would work when you remove the commissions. And I think we've proven that otherwise by making this the standard model by which brokerages operate now. I see. Okay, Mr. Tennant, I have to I have to move on very quickly. I have a, a timeline question here uh, for Mr. Plotkin. I see that um, you know it, earlier your testimony today was that hello. Earlier, I, I um, your testimony today was that uh, Melvin Capital had not engaged in. Um, oh, I see if you Oh, that. sorry, M Madam Chairwoman. I'm sorry. I think I think you're not muted. <laughs> sorry about that, uh, Mr. Plotkin. Earlier today, you know, you mentioned that Melvin Capital had not engaged um, in a naked short of GameStop, and Melvin closed out its position on GME on the twenty-sixth. Correct. I'm sorry. The gentle lady's time has expired, but we have to go to Mr. Archon Claus for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, and I want to thank our panel for being with us through a, a very uh, substantive and, and long afternoon. I think I might be a welcome face for them because I, as the most junior member, I'm the last one to ask questions here. Uh, and I want to talk with Mr. Tenev about options. Um, I agree with what other members of the committee have said of, in both parties about the value of democratizing access to assets. And that we should give latitude for independent uh, retail investors judgment. Uh, but in fields where there is an information asymmetry between the user of a product or a service and the provider of it, there's always a professional code of ethics around that. When you go to the doctor, when you go to the lawyer, there is a code of ethics wrapped around that interaction that protects someone who doesn't understand as much about the service being provided. And in finance, as you're well aware, there's a fiduciary responsibility to do what's right. In Massachusetts, where there's 500,000 users of Robinhood, uh, we hold broker-dealers to a fiduciary standard, and the Secretary of State's Securities Division filed a complaint against Robinhood for violating that fiduciary standard, and so some of it was premised on options. Two-thirds of customers approved in Massachusetts for options trading identified as having limited to no investment experience. Uh, and so the first question I would ask you, Mr. Tenev, and please take no more than a minute is, what do you think is the appropriate amount of financial literacy that a user should have before they should be allowed to trade options? Thank you for the question, Congressman. Um, let me first say that Robinhood really pioneered commission-free and zero contract fee options trading and I think um, our market leadership in this space is due to the fact that we not only provide that access, but um, have improved upon the safety of our product in several ways over the past few years. Number one, we don't allow undefined risk options trades. So no selling of naked calls, uh, no undefined risk. Um, number two, we made several enhancements to the safety of the product uh, over the past year including the ability to perform an instant in-app exercise um, of an options position, uh, clarifications around the user interface, live customer support by phone for urgent options cases. So we've, we've actually proven and are committed to improving in the future the safety of our options offering. But to be clear here, op options are decaying assets. They're binary in outcome. So they are qualitatively and quantitatively different than stocks and bonds in the sense that you can lose all your money very fast and you can make a lot of money very fast as well. But this is getting very close to gambling. And especially when you gamify the options buying experience as your app does, it can very quickly turn into a casino like feel. And so I'd ask you just to address the question again, what level of investment sophistication do you think a retail trader should have before they are buying options? Sure, uh, Congressman, I appreciate the follow-up. So I, I should first say there's strict FINRA rules and regulations governing who gets access to options that of course Robinhood complies with. I also should note, we're in a competitive market. You know, several others have mentioned um, Chinese-based brokerages, other brokerages that are essentially offering similar products, all having to comply with these regulations. So we're certainly willing to engage in a discussion about um, 
how, how rules should change, if at all. Uh, and as long as they're applied uniformly and are fair to small investors and not just benefiting high net worth individuals and institutions, we'd be open to having that conversation. The standard for my constituents in Massachusetts is not going to be what the Chinese regulators think is appropriate. It's going to be a fiduciary standard. Uh, I, I regret that you really haven't addressed the question. And I, so I guess I would ask a separate one, which is, would you commit here to offering in an, a higher in-app threshold, including but not limited to uh, financial education before allowing people to purchase uh, options? Uh, again, Congressman, I'd be happy to engage in this topic substantively. I think as long as those requirements are uniformly applied to all brokerages and not just startup brokerages or brokerages catering to small investors, we're open to having that conversation. Well, the fiduciary standard is applied equally to all brokerages, and yours is the one that was singled out by the Massachusetts Securities Division as having violated that, given the way that your users are using the options. I will see the balance of my time, uh, Madam Chairwoman, uh, and uh, I thank you for arranging this. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, and with that, Mr. Garcia of Illinois, you are recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and uh, a Ranking Member uh, for the important hearing. It's long, this you know, it's a long day. I wanted to ask some questions to uh, Mr. Griffin. Uh, would you consider, Mr. Griffin, your firm successful? This is an easy yes or no. Yes, I would consider Citadel to be successful, and I would consider yes, Citadel sir. Securities to be successful. And, of course, I'd agree that you've done uh, pretty well for yourself. Uh, as you mentioned earlier uh, in your testimony, uh, your company handles uh, over 40% of retail trading. Did I get that correct? Citadel Securities is the largest destination for retail airflow in the United States. It reflects the execution quality that we give. And uh, Citadel is uh, a leading market marker uh, for interest rate swaps as well. Is that correct? Uh, due to the great work of the House and Senate on the back of Dodd-Frank, where we permitted competition to exist in the interest rate swap market, and I'm grateful for that opportunity to compete in that market. We are now a swap dealer at Citadel Securities and a significant participant in that market. And I'd like to express my gratitude. <clears throat> Very well. For Dodd-Frank's derivatives reform. Good. Uh, your uh, hedge fund uh, managers, uh, do you manage uh, over 30 billion, uh, is that correct? Uh, Congressman, yes, that is correct. We manage approximately okay. $35 billion of assets 35. for pension plans, for endowments, for colleges, for charities. Okay. Very, very well. That's pretty uh, significant. I'd say that's uh, a lot. It seems to me that your company is systemically important to our financial system. Would you agree with that? I believe that we play an important role in the U.S. capital markets. I believe that our hedge fund would not be in the category of systemically important. With 30 some billion dollars of equity, it is simply not at the scale or magnitude of a JP Morgan, a Bank of America, a Wells Fargo. And in yes. particular, having worked on these policy issues with members of the Fed in various contexts, we don't have to make payroll on Friday. Okay, uh, but, but, you're, you're, but you're, you're doing pretty well. And yes, you're not one of the big guys that we uh, have visit us uh, frequently, uh, at least a couple of times a year. Uh, is Citadel Securities, uh, were, you were fined recently by FINRA for trading ahead of customer orders in the past. Is that what I heard from a couple of questioners earlier today? I believe this was brought up earlier that we paid a fine to FINRA for uh, trading ahead in the OTC market back in the, let's say, roughly 2012 through 2014. It was due to a systems failure. Now, we have no tolerance internally for having made such a mistake. We have, of course, have taken actions to rectify such mistakes. Okay, and but that, 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 did, that did occur. That Just did occur. Okay. So it, it's 
Okay, I appreciate more. that. It, it seems to me that uh, the retail investors using uh, their savings are not exactly an even match for a complex, deeply connected firm uh, like Citadel. Uh, would you agree with that? I, I don't actually understand the premise of the question. Retail investors who do good research, and I, I, one of our fellow panelists said earlier, many retail investors have understood the game-changing technologies unfolding before us, electric cars, solar energy, and have done extraordinarily well investing their assets into these newly emerging parts of the economy. Okay, and your firm uh, has done, and you've personally done well during the pandemic, right? There hasn't been much of an adverse effect on your firm? Uh, Congressman, we've all been adversely impacted by the pandemic. I think all of us long for the return back to life as it was a year and a half ago. But you have, but you haven't done badly, right? So there are two dimensions to this. There's the personal impact on everybody, and we've all had to deal with loved right. ones, with family. But in terms of your bottom line, sir, our bottom line over the course of the last year has been successful, sir, Congressman. Okay, good. That's what I thought. Uh, is it true that last year in Illinois, uh, you were involved uh, in a an effort uh, and you spent like uh, close to $50 million to defeat a, uh, a tax increase in, in Illinois uh, that would have uh, forced uh, the big uh, income earners like yourself to pay more in taxes in Illinois, a progressive tax? The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, I Thank you, Madam Chair. All members, all members uh, on the platform today have been heard and had an opportunity to raise their questions. And so before we get to closing statements, I would like to ask unanimous consent to enter letters into the record from the following entities. Better Markets, Public Citizen, Depository Trust and Clear Corporation and Healthy Markets. So without objection, it is so ordered. I now yield one minute uh, to the gentleman from Missouri, uh, Mr. Lukemeyer, for brief closing remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank all the witnesses for being here today. I thought you all did a great job, and we really thank you for spending time with us and educating us on uh, the market and all the activities surrounding GameStop investing and short selling. I'd like to uh, to reiterate the ranking member's commitment that the House Financial Services Committee Republicans stand ready to work with the majority to continue to uh, provide oversight on and investigation of uh, the game stock activities. And going forward, I hope that we always have an eye towards protecting and giving more choice and access to America's everyday investors. With that, Madam Chair, I yield back. I now yield myself one minute. Today, the committee has heard firsthand a public group of witnesses about their roles in the market volatility in late January. This hearing has allowed us to begin to assess what transpired and whether our guardrails have not kept up with the rapid changes uh, the markets have experienced. For example, I'm more concerned than ever that investors are being fleeced in massive market makers like Citadel may pose a systemic threat to the entire system. The committee is going to continue to examine these issues. Our next hearing will include securities market experts, investor advocates to discuss the policy issues that are involved and potential solutions to problems with our system that these events have eliminated. I will also convene a hearing to hear testimony from the regulators including the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Financial Industry Regulator Authority, that is FINRA. All of these hearings will inform the committee's role and help us to determine potential legislative steps to protect investors and ensure Wall Street accountability. With that, I'd like to thank our distinguished witnesses for their testimony here today. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days with an to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. So I ask our witnesses to please respond as properly as you're able. So without objection, all members 
will have five legislative days within which to submit these extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. And I sincerely thank you. And I want all of us to pay attention to what is happening in Texas and to do what is necessary uh, to be able to give assistance uh, to all of our people, all of the families uh, in Texas that are experiencing this very, very difficult time. Thank you so very much. This hearing is adjourned. <laughs>